All right, outstanding. I'd like to welcome everyone. Welcome everyone to the winter meeting of the ASMFC. Uh, this is the Summer Flounder Scup and Black Sea Bass Management Board. Uh, we are. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, this will be board action only this morning, but we are joined by the Mid-Atlantic Council today. Uh, we will have joint actions that will be taken up throughout the day, the policy board meeting coming up after this meeting, uh, followed by continuation of this board meeting for uh, Black Sea Bass Commercial Amendment Addendum Action, uh, which will be joint actions with the council. So, uh, council. so welcome, everyone. Uh, to those being impacted by weather today, be safe, uh, enjoy, if you like the snow, if not, well, put the shades down outside. Uh, so this uh, meeting has been called to order. Uh, we'll begin with an approval of an agenda. Uh, the agenda that was provided in the meeting materials, we'll note that after we recess this morning, uh, we do plan to uh, reconvene jointly at 12.45, not 1 o'clock. Uh, are there any other objections to the agenda as provided or changes? Okay, seeing no changes and hearing no objections, the agenda is approved by consent. Uh, next, we'll go on to approval of proceedings from the August 2020 board meeting. Uh, are is there any objection to approval of those proceedings? Okay, I'm not seeing any objection objections, so those proceedings will stand approved as provided. Next, we'll go on to public comment for any actions that are not on this morning portion of the agenda, uh, which is state proposals for the 2021 recreational season. Uh, is there any public comment for anything else that's not on our agenda? Seeing any hands raised nor hearing anything, uh, we will then proceed to the next agenda item, which is a presentation for 2021 recreational management measure uh, changes by a select number of states. And we'll turn it over to staff for that. Thank you very much. Thanks, Mr. Chair. Um, Savannah, now would be a good time to switch over the shared screen. Perfect. Yes, so as was just alluded to, uh, this is the Summer Flounder Black Sea Bass and Recreational Proposals Consideration for the board. Um, this agenda item was originally an hour and 15 minutes and it's got whittled down to 30 minutes. So we'll keep it very concise and to the point. <clears throat> so moving to the next slide, please. We'll just cover the background um, to give a little perspective on what this process is about. Uh, then we'll cover the proposals to modify recreational fisheries themselves, um, then followed by the TC recommendations, and then the board action today will be considering approval of the proposals. Next slide. So just to jog your memory, um, since this happened before the holiday break, the joint meeting in December that was hosted by the council uh, was was uh, with the board as well, and they voted to maintain status quo summer flounder scup and black sea bass recreational measures for 2021. Um, however, there was the exception made where board, the board was allowed to um, have states submit proposals for small adjustments to season uh, for recreational fisheries through the conservation equivalency process. This would just allow states to add some flexibility um, if they wanted to start on a Friday or a Saturday, considering that the dates were set um, as a number and not a day of the week. Next slide, please. So in all, we received uh, three proposals. Two are going through the conservation equivalency process, uh, New Jersey and Massachusetts for summer flounder and black sea bass respectively. And then uh, we have the annual Virginia February fishery proposal for black sea bass and Savannah will be covering the black sea bass items, but I'll launch right into the New Jersey proposal for summer flounder. Next slide, please. So this proposal uh, has actually 
very similar to last year's proposal. Uh, New Jersey is very keen on opening on the Friday of Memorial Day weekend, uh, which would mean a May 28th to September 28th season. Um, this proposal uh, would actually delay the start of the season by six days um, compared to the status quo dates of last year. Um, and it would then add nine days to the end of the season to account for the delay. Um, it's not a one for one adjustment there, a day for day adjustment, um, because the estimated effect of uh, moving the, the season forward by six days um, would have a greater reduction uh, than six days being added to the end of the season. So when you look at uh, daily harvest rates, um, computed by taking total landings per wave in numbers of fish and dividing by the number of days in each wave for each year. Uh, then you get a daily harvest rate for wave three and wave five. And uh, this analysis found that wave three harvest, uh, daily average harvest was greater than wave five using 2018 and 2019 MRF data. Um, so the proposal ends with uh, just three more days than they would have had last year, um, but the actual harvest itself is projected to be 0.09% lower than harvest done under the uh, status quo season. And it's important to note here that all other regulations will be kept consistent. Um, we're only talking about a small seasonal adjustment. Uh, next slide, and Savannah, you can take it from here. Okay, thank you, Dustin. So now I'm going to review the proposals that we got for black sea bass. Uh, we received a proposal from Massachusetts to modify their 2021 recreational black sea bass fishery under conservation equivalency. Traditionally, they've had a Saturday opening uh, currently under status quo. The season will open on a Tuesday. So they came up with two different alternative op options to have the season opener on a Saturday. Option A, which opens the Saturday before status quo on May 15th, and option B, which opens the Saturday after status quo on May 22nd. To account for the shift in season opening, they looked at modified season closure dates. These dates were calculated using the mean daily harvest rates by wave for 2018 and 2019. The TC ended up approving a combined 2018 and 2019 methodology. Due to the difference in harvest rates for wave three compared to wave five, different season openings resulted in different season closure dates. For option A, the season will close on September 3rd for a total of 112 days. For option B, the season will close on September 14th for a total of 116 days. Uh, all other regulations will be kept consistent and the options if approved today will be taken out for public comment to determine which option Massachusetts will go with. Both options are expected to produce harvest that is similar or less than previous harvest rates. And they had to calculate the differences um, in season closures due to the different harvest rates between wave three and wave five. For Virginia, um, as Dustin alluded, this is again a traditional opening now for them. Uh, they would like to open their record or they will be opening their recreational back sea bass um, from February 1 to February 28th as a response to NOAA fisheries opening in federal waters. They intend to open their um, BMRC will then calculate landings in February from their mandatory angler reporting and make appropriate season adjustments. Due to the lack of MRF data in 2020, 2021 harvest will be compared to daily harvest rates by wave from 2018 and 2019 MRF landings in pounds and the number of days open in each wave by year. BMRC will then submit a proposal for season adjustments for the remainder of 2021 to account for all February harvest. All other regulations will be kept consistent. The technical committee met on January 19th via webinar to review the proposals from the three states. The technical committee had no concerns with the proposals and found all of the methods to be technically sound. The technical committee recommends approval of all three proposals for adjusting measures. The technical committee was also supportive of streamlining this process such that the TC would review proposals over email and the board would then vote via email instead of at a meeting. So finally, here's a list of the board actions to be taken today. First, the board to consider approval of 2021 Summer Flounder Recreational Fishery Proposal from New Jersey. 
consider the approval of the 2021 Black Sea Bass Recreational Fishery from Massachusetts and consider approval of 2021 Black Sea Bass February Recreational Fishery Proposal from Virginia. And with that, uh, Justin and I are happy to take any questions. All right, thank you very much uh, to staff for that presentation. Uh, are there any questions from anyone around the table on the information provided? Okay, not seeing any hands up or hearing anything for anyone that can't raise a hand. Uh, so our next step would be to entertain a motion for approval of these. Would anyone be willing to make that motion? Uh, I've got a first hand up I saw it was Jim Gilmore. Would you like to make a motion regarding these proposals, Jim? Sure, Mr. Chairman. I move to approve the recreational measures for summer flounder for New Jersey, uh, black sea bass for Massachusetts, black sea bass for Virginia for the 21. Oh, you got one up already, All right? Uh, I'll go with that. Jim, we need you to read that. For the record, okay. please. Move to approve the following 2021 recreational conservation equivalency season adjustments. New Jersey summer flounder fishery, May 28th through September 28th, and Massachusetts black sea bass fishery options A, May 15th to September 3rd, and B, May 22nd to September 19th, and approve Virginia's proposal for adjusting recreational black sea bass measures to account for February harvest. Very good. Thank you very much. I uh, see a hand raised from Michael Lisi. Is that the second this motion? That is, Adam. Thank you. Yeah, I'll second that. All right. Very good. So we have a motion uh, that's been made and seconded. Uh, is there any discussion on this motion? Uh, Jim, did you want to go ahead and provide any other information or was your hand still up for making the motion? Sorry, Mr. Chairman, my hand was just up. I'll put it down and uh, I'm good to go. Very good. Thank you very much. Uh, got a hand raised from Nicola Missouri. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just wanted to point out that the date for option B in Massachusetts should be uh, September 14th. All right, we've corrected that on screen. Uh, the uh, Is there any objection to uh, having that perfected on screen with the option B motion being corrected to an end date of September 14th? Okay, not seeing any objection to that. Uh, would you like me to go ahead and reread the motion since there was that change made to it since it was originally read in or is that not necessary, Tony? I think it's okay since we have that correction on the record. Okay, very good. Uh, is there any uh, public comment on this motion? All right, not seeing any public comment. Uh, I am going to go ahead and ask the board, is there any objection to this motion? Okay, seeing no objections, the motion stands approved. Thank you very much. Uh, with that, unless there's any other business to come before us this morning, we're ready to move to recess, Tony, for policy board. That's correct, Adam. Um, policy board starts at 10.15. Great. Okay, um, this is Caitlin Starks. I am the, I guess, outgoing FMP coordinator for Black Sea Bass. Um, after this meeting, we will be passing that off to Savannah Lewis, um, but I'll be going over the draft addendum 33 and council amendment presentation today. So in this presentation, I'll first cover some background information on this action leading up to this meeting. Then I'll review the different options for the Black Sea Bass commercial state allocations, go over the way forward for taking action on the addendum and amendment and um, next steps for implementation. 
so as a reminder, draft addendum 33 in the council amendment mainly address two things. First is considering modifying the state commercial allocations of the black sea bass quota. And second is whether to add those state allocations to the council's FMP. In the December um, joint meeting, the board and council met at the mid Atlantic council meeting and they reviewed draft addendum 33 and the council amendment, the public comments. AP input and a draft impact analysis. And at that meeting, the board and council selected alternatives for the federal management portions of the action, but agreed to postpone decisions on the allocations and the final action on the documents until February um, 2021 to this meeting. So uh, this table summarizes the proposed alternatives for federal management that were selected and the boxes highlighted in green are, are those alternatives that were selected by the board and council at the December meeting. So for the first issue, the board and council voted to add the state allocations to the council FMP and maintain status quo for paybacks of state quota overages. And on the next issue, they voted to modify the regulations for federal in-season closures so that a closure would occur when landings are projected to exceed the coastwide quota plus a buffer of up to 5%, which would be established annually through specifications by the board and council. And today the board and council will consider which of the options for the state allocations to adopt. So I'll go over each of those options, which are summarized again on this flowchart. Um, and I'm going to move fairly quickly through these since they've been presented to the board and council before, but I can always come back um, with questions on more detail if there are any at the end. Option A is status quo state allocations, which are shown in the table on the right. And these allocations were implemented in 2003 through Amendment 13 and were loosely based on historical landings from 1980 to 2001. Option B proposes to increase Connecticut's allocation from 1% to 5% in order to address the disparity between their current allocation and the increased availability of black sea bass in Connecticut state waters. And the option proposes to get that um, allocation from 1% to 5% by holding Delaware and New York constant, moving 0.25% each from Maine and New Hampshire to Connecticut, and finally, moving some quota from each of the remaining states to Connecticut in proportion to their current allocations until you get up to that total of 5% for Connecticut's overall allocation. And the last column in the table shows what the allocations would be that result from this method. And I'll note again that this option is intended either as a standalone change to the allocations or as a starting point for additional allocation changes through one of the other options. Option C is dynamic adjustments to regional allocations, AKA the DARA approach, which aims to gradually adjust the state allocations while incorporating information on the changing stock distribution. And during the first phase, um, a transition would take place over several years where the initial allocations are gradually adjusted using a formula to become more dependent on the current stock distribution. So at the end of that transition period, the allocations would be based partially on stock distribution information and partially on the initial allocations. In phase two, the formula is no longer being adjusted to give more weight to the stock distribution component, but instead the allocations would only be updated when new information on regional stock distribution becomes available, such as when there's a new stock assessment. And the sub options for this approach are designed to represent ranges of values that the board and council can work within to determine how fast and how much the allocations would change overall through this approach. And as a quick reminder of how the DARA approach works, the first step is to divide the coastwide quota into one portion that would be allocated based on the initial allocations and one portion that would be allocated according to the stock distribution. And what those percentages are um, in each year would be determined by the sub options that are selected. Next, the first portion gets distributed to all states based on their initial allocations. And the second portion gets divided regionally based on the proportions of stock biomass in each region. Then those regional portions get allocated to the states in each region in proportion to their initial allocations. And finally, each state gets its overall allocation from the part of the quota allocated using the initial allocations plus the part of the quota that's allocated regionally. And as a quick note, um, this would look slightly different in the last few steps if New Jersey were made an individual region. 
suboptin set C1 for the DARE approach determines the relative weights of the initial allocations versus the resource distribution information in determining the state allocations at the end of the transition phase. So option C1A is that at the end of the transition phase, the allocations would be 90% based on stock distribution and 10% based on the initial allocations. And option C1B is that the allocations end up being based 50% on stock distribution and 50% on the initial allocations. And as a reminder, the board and council could choose a final option falling between these two if desired. So these are just examples of how those uh, would be split out under these two options. Sub option set C2 would determine how much the relative weights of the initial allocation and the resource distribution factors change with each adjustment during the transition phase. Sub option C2A is that the relative weights would change by 5% per adjustment, which is a slower transition. And sub option C2B is that the relative weights would change by 20% per adjustment, and that would give you a faster transition to those final weights. DARA sub-option set C3 determines how often during the transition period those adjustments are made to the weights of the initial allocation and stock distribution factors. And the two options are either to do adjustments every year or every other year. Set C4 provides the option to set a cap on the amount of change in the regional allocations per adjustment during the transition period. And there's three options here, a 3% cap, a 10% cap or no cap. And the general function of that cap is that it reduces the amount of change in the allocations that can happen during a single adjustment. So if during an adjustment, the formula is dictating that the regional allocations should change by 9% overall, but you have that 3% cap in place, in that adjustment, the regional change would only be 3%. Um, so that does end up drawing out the transition period over time if um, the cap is needed during multiple years. So the next proposed option is option D, which is the trigger approach. And this establishes a minimum level of coastwide quota as a trigger for a change in the state allocations. And if the annual coastwide quota exceeds that trigger, then the amount of coastwide quota up to and including that amount would be distributed to the states according to the base allocations or initial allocations. And the sur surplus quota above the trigger would be distributed differently. Suboptins D1A or D1B would determine the trigger level, and D1A is a 3 million pound trigger, whereas D1B is a 4.5 million pound trigger. And this figure just shows how these trigger levels compare to the coastwide quotas since 1998. Um, and as a reminder, these suboptions are also meant to provide a range, so the board and council could select something between 3 and 4.5 million pounds. Suboption set D2 determines how the surplus quota above the trigger value is distributed to the states. Um, option D2A is to distribute the surplus quota evenly to all states from Massachusetts through North Carolina. And option D2B is to distribute the surplus quota among regions based on regional biomass proportions from the stock assessment. And under both of these options, Maine and New Hampshire would each be receiving only 1% of the surplus quota. So if option D2B is chosen from the last set, then there's two suboptions that would determine how the regional surplus quotas would be divided among the states within each region. D3A is that the states would um, each get equal shares of the regional surplus. And D3B is that the regional quota would be divided among the states in a region in proportion to their initial allocations. And again, Maine and New Hampshire are the exception, each only getting 1% of the northern region surplus. The last set of options for the trigger approach determines if the base allocations for the quota up to and including the trigger would change over time. And these sub options are only applicable if the option for regional surplus allocations is selected. So sub option D4A is for static base allocations where the quota up to and including the trigger would always be allocated using the same initial allocations. And sub option D4B is for dynamic base allocations. And that means that each year, the quota up to and including the trigger amount would be allocated according to the previous year's final state allocations. So that results in those base allocations changing over time. Next is option E. Um, this is also a trigger approach, but the surplus quota would 
be applied to increase the Connecticut and New York allocations first before going to other states. So it proposes using a three million uh, three million pound trigger level, and the first three million pounds would be distributed based on those initial allocations, and then surplus quota would first be used to increase Connecticut's allocation from one percent to five percent, and then additional surplus after that would be used to increase New York's allocation from seven percent to nine percent, and then lastly, um, any remaining surplus quota would be split between the northern and southern regions based on the proportion of biomass in each region from the stock assessment, and um, then allocated to the states within each region in proportion to their initial allocations. The last approach is option F, which we're calling the percentage approach. And the way it would work is that it would allocate a certain fixed percentage of the annual coastwide quota to the states based on the initial allocations. And the remaining percentage would be allocated in a different way, either evenly among the states or regionally. So suboption set F1 determines the percentage of coastwide quota that would be allocated based on the initial allocations. And the two options are either 25% or 75%. And like other sub options, these are also meant to represent a range for the board and council to work within. The 25% option would result in allocations that are more different from the current allocations. And the 75% option would result in allocations that are more similar to the current allocations. So like the trigger approach, the percentage approach also has sub options that determine how to distribute the percentage of the annual quota that's not allocated based on the initial allocations. So with sub option F2A, remaining quota would be allocated to all states equally, except remain in New Hampshire, which again, get 1% each of the remaining portion. And with sub option F2B, the remaining quota is distributed based on the regional biomass from the stock assessment. And if option F2B is chosen, then option set F3 determines how the regional quota is distributed to those states within a region. F3A is to distribute the regional quota evenly to states within each region. And F3B is to distribute the regional quota in proportion to the initial interregional allocations. So again, under both of these options, Maine and New Hampshire are getting 1% of that northern region quota. So um, for those options that would use a regional distribution of black sea bass from the stock assessment as a basis for regional allocation, there are two options to, for defining the regional configuration. Option G1 would establish two regions, a northern region, including Maine through New York, and a southern region, including New Jersey through North Carolina. And option G2 would establish three regions. Maine through New York would make up the northern region. New Jersey would be an individual region and Delaware through North Carolina would make up the southern region. And while both of these are generally aligned with the spatial subunits used in the stock assessment, which are divided approximately at Hudson Canyon, um, option G2 is attempting to address New Jersey's unique position where some of its waters are in the northern region and some in the south. So under option G2, New Jersey is treated as if half of its initial 20% allocation comes from the northern region and half from the southern region. So that covers all of the options for the state commercial allocations. And this is just a summary table of everything I just went over for reference. So that brings us to today. Um, the board and council will be considering which of the state allocations to adopt and following that decision, considering final approval of addendum 33 and the council amendment. And if the addendum and amendment are approved today, then these are the next steps for each action. So for the commission addendum, the board can select the implementation date and that's when the new allocations would go into effect for the states. And for the council amendment, if approved, um, the council would need to write up the draft environmental assessment and submit that with the amendment to no fisheries. And then additional changes to the document might be made um, based on the feedback from no fisheries and once that's done, the federal rulemaking process would begin, including the proposed rule and public comment period and then final rule. Um, so from today to publishing the final rule, we would usually expect this process to take between 10 to 16 months, but there's a possibility um, of that taking longer if there's you know, additional workload from other actions ongoing. So um, with that, uh, that's all I have to cover, but I will, I will pass it over to Julia Beatty of council staff now to go over the council staff recommendation. 
Thanks, Caitlin. Um, so just to kind of kick off the discussion, um, this is the council staff recommendation for changes to the allocation percentages among states. So um, it's based on the percentage approach, but it does first allow for that increase from for Connecticut to increase from 1% to 5%. Um, and then it uses the percentage approach to first allocate 75% of the annual quota based on those initial allocations, which would account for that Connecticut increase to 5%. And then the remaining 25% of the quota will be allocated based on the most recent regional biomass distribution information from the assessment. And then that regional amount is further divided among the states within the region in proportion to their initial state allocations, which would account for that Connecticut increase of 5%. And except that Maine and New Hampshire would each receive 1% of the northern region quota, as Caitlin described. And under this recommendation, there's um, the three region approach um, with Maine through New York as one region, New Jersey as its own region, and Delaware through North Carolina as a third region. Um, and the reason that this combination of alternatives is the council staff recommendation is that, um, first of all, it addresses the unique position of both Connecticut and New Jersey, and they're unique for different ways. Um, as Caitlin described, Connecticut has this particularly low current allocation, um, which is kind of a mismatch with the big increase in availability that they've seen in recent years. So this recommendation addresses that. And then also addresses the fact that New Jersey um, is a, in a unique position in that it straddles the border between the northern and southern subunits as defined in the um, stock assessment. So it allows for that kind of um, for New Jersey to be treated as if it's um, you know, different from the other states in that way. Um, and also the rationale behind the percentage approach is that it allows for some amount of the quota to account for recent distribution information regardless of whatever the overall quota level is. So this is different than the trigger approach, for example. The trigger approach would have the allocation um, change depending on what the overall quota level is. This approach is the same no matter what the overall quota is. So you always have some amount of the quota that would account for distribution information, but most of the quota, 75%, would be allocated according to these initial allocations. So it's seeking to balance um, a desire to account for the historical dependence of the states on the fishery, that's that 75%, and then while also allowing for some amount of allocation to shift around to account for more current biomass distribution. Um, and this would be updated every time we get new distribution information from the stock assessment. So in that way, it'll help to provide continued fair access to the resource because it's not going to set an allocation that's just going to stay completely unchanged for, you know, a few decades because it would be part of it would be always updated every time we get that new um, biomass distribution information. And then if somebody could move to the next slide, there's an example of what the recommendation would look like under the most recent biomass distribution information, which is based on data through 2018, the information that we have right now. So again, the staff recommendation is to approve that process that I described. So you wouldn't be approving a specific percentage to a state in any given year, but this is an example of what that process would result in with the current biomass distribution information. So to kind of walk through this table, um, there's a row for every state, and then that first column there is what the allocations currently are, and then the next column is what would be to find the initial allocations accounting for first bringing Connecticut up to 5%, and then the next column is the revised allocations where 75% of the allocations is based on those initial allocations, and the remaining 25% accounts for biomass distribution according to the most recent information that we have. Um, and then the last column is just the difference between that revised allocation column and the current allocations column. And you can see that under um, this example, no state would lose more than 4.21% of the total coastwide quota, and no state besides Connecticut would gain more than 2.1%. So um, it moves a total of 10.21% from New Jersey to North Carolina to Maine to New York. So it does move some allocation to account for recent biomass distribution, um, but it's not taking a huge amount from 
some states and giving a huge amount to other states. So it was trying to um, keep the balance in that way as well. Um, and so that's all I had um, for the council staff recommendation for the group to consider. And I, I think that's it for the whole presentation. I don't know if, um, Caitlin, you needed to say anything else at this point, but that's all I had to say for the council staff recommendation. Thanks, Julia. No, that's all I had as well. So I think we're happy to take any questions if that's the pleasure of the chairs. All right, thank you very much, both Caitlin and Julia. I suspect, uh, well, first, let me begin by thanking Caitlin for all her time and efforts on Black Sea Bass over the years. It's been a pleasure working with her. I suspect no one is counting down the clock till 4.30 faster than Caitlin today. Uh, so, that being said, uh, let me first turn to Mike Luisi to see if he's got anything he would like to add uh, based on the presentation we've heard. Uh, and then we will turn to the board and council for questions. Yeah, thank thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, <clears throat> no, I don't I don't have anything to add other than I think what we need to discuss is the process. And so um, during our December meeting, we had the conversation about voting on this on these alternatives, and we decided that. At the time, the council would vote first on whether or not to add the allocations into the federal FMP, and we did that. Um, I think at this point, I, you know, Adam and you and I have talked. I, we're at the point where any motion that's made regarding the state by state allocations will be taken up will be taken up first by the board, and the council will follow. Um, and I'll call the question for the council, but. Um, so that, as far as process, that's the one thing I wanted to I wanted to add. But the other thing I wanted to I, I had a question. If it's okay, Mr. Chairman, if I could ask a question of uh, Julia or Caitlin, is that okay? One hundred percent okay. Okay. So I just I wanted I wanted to get a little better handle on um, what the difference is between New Jersey being its own region or being within the southern region is there is there information about how allocations would be different or does it all basically smooth out and you know once it's all said and done if new jersey's its own region are the allocations all the same i'm just i, I just want to get a little bit better understanding about how what the difference is between them being by themselves or being with the southern region as far as allocations go based on the alternatives. I don't know if that's maybe that's a question for Julia or, or, or Caitlin, but um, if you can help me with that, that'd be great. Thanks. Mike, this is Caitlin. I'm happy to um, try and answer that in a general sense. So um, in draft addendum 33, there were some analyses done uh, in the appendix with all the different examples of the trigger approach and the percentage approach and how those outcomes might look. And some of those examples included a two region approach and some included a New Jersey um, individual region. So um, that is a good place to look if you want some specifics. But in general, I would say from looking through most of those, um, most of those examples that were done, is that New Jersey, when it's treated as an individual region, because it's treated as if some of its quota is coming from the northern region and some is coming from the southern region, as those allocations are shifted based on the regional distribution of biomass, New Jersey is is seeing some increases for part of its, you know, like the, its quotas derived from the northern region in part. So it is seeing an increase from that part and a decrease simultaneously from the southern region. So um, New Jersey's allocation doesn't change as much as some of the other states do over time. Um, and I would say it, it, it kind of hovers around that 20% more closely than some of the other state allocations, if that makes sense. Yeah, that helps. Thank you. All right. So in full disclosure, uh, in the list of questions, uh, Mike did have his hand up first, so that contributed to his 100% okay rating for going ahead and answering questions. Uh, so in terms of hands that I see right now, I've got Jim Gilmore, Tony Delernia, and then Jay Maximates. 
So we'll go to Jim Gilmore first. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I, I got it pretty clear from from uh, Julia and, and Caitlin that there, so the staff recommendation was uh, was under F, uh, and I think you explained pretty well the rationale behind it. Um, <clears throat> however, the one thing um, you didn't elaborate on, and I wish you could, is that um, I guess it supposes that the it, this is better than the Dara option, but I'm still having a little trouble understanding. Um, why the DARA options are not, um, you know, being considered, or this was a, the F option was a higher priority than the DARA options, because the one thing that the, uh, you know, any of the triggers or option F does, we're still holding on to the past. We're going to forever use data that we have that will become sometime 50 to 80 years old, and we're going to, you know, possibly include that. So. To me, the one thing that um, the DARA options provide is that it does this gradually um, and it really looks at uh, leaving the past and going into the future and maybe the right way to do it. And some of those DARA options um, provide less impact for the southern states. The percentages are a lot smaller. So could you just elaborate a little bit more as to um, why the DARA options were not chosen and, uh, you know, and, and why the F ones are really superior to them? Thanks. So, J Jim, before I turn to staff, uh, let me just make a couple of clarifications. Number one, the recommendation that's before us right now is a council staff recommendation. It is not an ASMFC staff recommendation at the present time. Uh, and Julia was kind enough to offer that up as a starting point for discussions. But let me say that as we go through the day, after we get through questions and we get to motions, it is not my intention to have that be the first motion. Uh, it will be at the discretion of the board. Uh, if in the order of operations of people speaking, uh, we get to a point where we're ready for motions and somebody chooses to make that motion and it becomes the first motion, so be it. Um, but it is not the default first motion that we're going to consider. It is a council staff motion, and it's not an ASMFC staff motion. So I just want to provide that little bit of clarity uh, before we turn to uh, Julie, if she wants to elaborate, since it was a council staff recommendation, uh, or any other staff members that would be appropriate to provide feedback to Jim. This is Julie. I can respond to that. Um, you know, in short, the reason this was preferred by staff over the DARE approach is that it's more simple. Um, and the uh, intent by ha behind having it be the 75-25% percentage is that that get that um, a similar idea to what you said with DARE, where it's, it's not making a big change. Um, and it would be updated every time you get new biomass distribution information. That 25% that's divided among the regions would um, shift potentially every time you get new biomass distribution information. But you're right with the DARE approach. You could um, kind of phase the changes in more explicitly. And if you wanted a bigger change, you could phase that in over time um, through the DARE approach. And this does not have a phase in, but because it's 75%, it's always Distributed based on the initial allocations, council staff thought that you know this could be okay to not phase it in because um, it's not a tremendous change. And if there's any other part of the uh, question that I missed, I can elaborate. But you know, in short, it's just this is a more um, simple, straightforward approach that was trying to achieve some similar things to what the DARA approach is trying to achieve. All right. Thanks, Julie. That's good. Yeah, and I, and I suspect there's going to be a lot more discussion as we get into motions about the merits of the approaches. So thank you. Uh, next up, uh, we'll go to uh, Tony Delernia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, to continue this uh, discussion on the DARA approach and what Julia was mentioning, uh, Julia, can you the the DARA approach basically is a percentage distribution, but could you use the formula in the DARA percentage distributions and apply it to the regions? Is, is that a is that a way that this could be the, the calculation from the DARA approach be applied towards the different regions? Can you do that? Um, 
this is Caitlin, and I'm just going to jump in instead of Julia, because I think I probably can answer that. So first, I want to make sure it's clear that the DARA approach does use a regional approach. Um, so that's the first part. Right. So I guess um, with that knowledge, does that answer your question? <laughs> no, no, okay. So that, that's what I thought. I thought I could use the DARA approach to create in Kiruluda. Uh, a regional approach. So then I guess the next question is a process question to uh, leadership, I guess to you, Mr. Chairman. If there's going to be a decision tree that occurs in this discussion, I would think that the first decision would be what the regional, re what the regions would look like. If we're going to use a regional approach and what the regions would look like, because once that's determined, then I think everything else flows from uh, the composition of the different regions. That's that's my thought. And I don't know what was your uh, preference, Mr. Chairman, in, in making, again, following this decision tree, but my recommendation would be first to decide if we're gonna use regions and if we are going to use regions, what that region, what those regions would look like. Thank you. Thank you, Tony. Well, uh, I'll offer my thoughts on that. The, the document as it currently lays out uh, would suggest that perhaps the greater precedent is what to do with regards to any flat rate adjustment to any state, Connecticut in particular. Uh, with regards to the regional approach, I think the implication of those regions varies by approach that we take. Uh, and for example, once we get down to the trigger, uh, the trigger does what it does regardless of what the configuration of the regions are. Uh, so from my perspective, uh, in our conversations with leadership and staff, uh, we did not come into this discussion with any preconceived notion of what the order of decisions would be. Uh, again, I think I would leave it to the board and the council and the preference of motions that are made uh, to actually decide that, I'll, I'll turn to Mike if he's got any other thoughts uh, with regards to the preference and whether he feels there's a need for uh, a regional decision to be made before any other decisions. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, no, nothing more to add. I to, to Tony's question, I, Tony. I think I think what's going to happen from discussions that I've had with with folks over the week, um, last week, is that kind of a full suite of, op, of is it, the allocation decision is gonna be kind of packaged together as like a, as a, a suite of options that combined together present the, the, the direction forward. So, um, but like Adam said, if, you, if you'd rather, take it piece by piece, that's okay too. Um, I just think that it might be cleaner if all of it's presented, if all of the allocation alternatives are presented in one package. I, I think of it as like a package. Um, that might be an easier way to make decisions because you're making a decision based on the full suite of options instead of one option at a time. So, but- if I mean, like you're right. Yeah, I understand to the saying. board. It's up to the board and the council how they want to deal with it. Okay, but there's a lot of moving parts here, uh, uh, all at the same time. And uh, maybe going back to what uh, Adam was uh, discussing, or most I suggested is that maybe we make a decision first: do we want to use the trigger approach or not? If you if you don't want to use the trigger, if you discount the trigger approach, then that discounts automatically a whole bunch of different options. So that you can begin to focus on other options as you go down that decision tree, and so uh, so that that's my my suggestion would be somehow to try to just uh, you know make this in a linear type of decision process in which you decide trigger no trigger. If there's no trigger, then what's the next? That would probably be Dara, and then once you get there, well, if we're going to do Dara, then do we want to do uh, uh, what are the regions going to look like, and and, and just try to try to, you know, slow down all these parts going in different directions. Right now, I feel like an octopus here, trying to cover everything at the same time. Thank you. All right, so what I've got on a list of people right now, and, and this is questions, uh, 
uh, let's make sure that we leave ourselves enough time. Again, I'm expecting a number of motions to be made on this topic. And I think we're going to have a lot of debate and we're going to need time on that. So let's make sure that any questions right now are relevant to what it's going to impact your decision making as to whether or not you want to put a motion up. So I'm going to go through a list of people that I have right now to speak. And if you would like to have, if you have a question, raise your hand now. We'll go through this process one more time after this bout of questions to see if it raised any other questions. And then after we get through the list of questions, then I'll come back and we'll go ahead and we'll have a race to raise hands to see who can get the first motion on the table first. So let me see a show of hands for people that have a distinct question that's going to impact whether uh, their decision making. Uh, so I had Jay McNamee from before. Other hands that had gone up. Uh, I've got Eric Reed. I've got Emerson Hasbrook. I've got Dan Farnham. And I've got Dave Ford. All right, so we're going to go with that for a list of questions. And then again, I'll make, I'll ask one more time after we go through these five, uh, individuals, uh, and then we'll get on to the business of decision making. Uh, Jay, you're up next with a question. Make sure you're unmuted on your device, Jay. I see you're unmuted in the webinar, but make sure your local device is unmuted as well. So I see Jay toggling back and forth in the webinar, but we're not getting anything on this end. So let me go on to the next person, Eric Reed, and then I'll come back to Jay again after Eric. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Nowalski. I've got a general question on, on uh, maybe on process. Would that be a fair game right now? Go ahead. Okay. Thank you very much. So, since this is not this is now a joint action of the Commission and the Council, uh, my question relates to the National Standard Four, which is allocations, and it's with regards to the two specific states. Uh, Section B, uh, National Standard 4, is discrimination among residents of different states. And it says that an FMP may not differentiate among U.S. citizens, nationals, resident aliens, or corporations on the basis of their state of residence. And subsection 1 further states that an FMP that restricts fishing in the EEZ to those holding a permit from state X would violate standard for if state X issues permits only to their own citizens. And I asked this question, uh, state X relates to Maryland and Delaware and their IT, uh, ITQ fisheries, which occur in the EEZ. So is there any guidance on uh, how this action affects those? So thanks for the question. Let me turn to staff to see if they've given any consideration, as I know they've got a lot of uh, analysis work that would have to be included uh, in an amendment. Uh, so let me turn to staff first, and depending on what they're able to provide, perhaps we can go to the fishery service. I'm guessing if um, we were all in a room together, they'd probably be looking at each other, wondering who's <laughs> going to try to take it. This is Julia. I can start, I guess. Um, so on the one hand, um, from the federal perspective, you know, this is, it's not restricting who can have a permit in which state. It's just saying how much black sea bass can be landed in each state. Um, so the, you know, the, the federal side of things isn't going to um, restrict, you know, to individuals as a resident of a state, for example. It's just going to say, where can these black sea bass be landed? And I'm not sure if there's anything else to add 
to that from the individual state perspective. Um, but and also maybe Gonzo might have other things to weigh in on that. But that's all I can say, like from an initial first thought for that from the council staff perspective. Anything from the service or legal from the service might want to weigh in on national standard four on the discussion so far, understanding that they haven't seen all the documents or the analysis, but based on Eric's question. Uh, Mike Petney, I see your hand is up, or is it to weigh in on this question? Yes. Go ahead, please. Okay, so um, I'm actually trying to figure out what um, or see exactly what it was that uh, Eric Reed was just reading, um, because there was there was some text that he was reading that went beyond um, the strict reading of what's in National Standard Four in the Magnuson Act. Um, which, you know, in terms of, of this approach is um, <clears throat> National Standard 4 says that allocations shall be fair and equitable to all fishermen, um, reasonably calculated to promote conservation and carried out uh, so that no individual has an excessive share. Um, so I just, I'm hoping to get, um, maybe Mr. Reed can, uh, can point me to um, the additional text that he was just reading. Eric, are you able to help Mike out on that? Yeah, sure. I, I'm reading the uh, Electronic Code of Federal, Federal Regulations, uh, CFR data current as of January 1, uh, 2021. It's uh, National Standard 4, which is 600-325, and I'm referring to Section B and Subsection 1 in that that line. If that's helpful. So that's from the national standard guidelines. Um, yeah, so let me take a quick look at that and uh, I can get back to the to the board and the council in a minute. Yeah, that'd be great. If you just go ahead and put your hand down and put your hand back up when you're prepared to uh, go ahead and provide some more input, we'll come back to you. Uh, so next, Jay McNamee, how are you making out with audio on your end? Hi, Mr. Chair. Um, can you hear me? Outstanding. You're good to go. Okay. Uh, and what I will do is um, say, uh, never mind. I, I'm good. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Well, we proved that we can get your audio going, so that gets you in a good spot. Uh, next up, Emerson Hasbrook. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, Emerson. We can hear you. Great, thank and just you. for everybody's benefit, I'll let you know if we can't hear you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And uh, thank you, uh, Caitlin and Julia, for your presentations. Um, I have a couple of questions. Uh, Jim already asked kind of what I was going to ask, so uh, <clears throat> I don't need to repeat that. But I'm wondering, um, Caitlin or Julia, would you have any information or a table that shows um, what the state, what what percentage of the state quota each state harvested in like 2020 or 2019? Have all states been harvesting 100% um, of their quota? Um, I'd like to see that. You know, what 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 percentage of the individual state quota the states are harvesting? Thanks, Emerson. Do we have um, that information I, available, or would that be something we'd have to pull up and come back to? I would have to pull it up and come back to it. We do have the information for previous years, although I would say for 2020, data is still preliminary, so um, it's definitely not final. Uh, I don't know if we should share those data that are not, you know, more vetted, but right. um, I can pull up information from 2019 and previous. All right, we'll give you an opportunity to do that uh, and come back to that. Emerson, did you have another question you wanted to ask? Right now, you're on mute on the webinar, Emerson. Yeah, I'm sorry, Mr. Chairman. I, I couldn't hear what the response was. I, I lost audio from the webinar. So I, I so couldn't hear. 
The response from staff was they don't have that information immediately available. Uh, they will try to pull up 2019 info in short order. They may not be able to provide 2020 at this point due to it not being finalized. So we'll try to get an answer to that percentage of state uh, allocation that was harvested uh, in as quickly as they can. Uh, while they're looking at that, did you have another question you wanted to ask? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm good for now. All right, thank you very much. So we'll check back with staff. Uh, again, just chime in since I can't see hands raised for staff. Uh, just when there's a break here, just go ahead and chime in if you've got an answer to that. Uh, let me go back to Mike Petney. He's got his hand back up to try to address Eric's question about NS4 guidelines. Mike. Yeah, thanks. And this isn't probably going to be a terribly um, helpful response. Uh, and John Almeida may want to uh, follow on. So. As I'm reading the national standard guidelines, it's a, the section that Eric Reed was reading is kind of a, an expansion of um, national standard for subpart A. Um, the national standard is that all allocations, um, well, allocations should not discriminate between res residents of different states, and any allocations that are necessary should be fair and equitable for all such fishermen. And then the national standard for kind of expansion of that. Um, is getting at um, that, you know, you, you can't differentiate among citizens on the basis of their state of residence. Um, so I've always interpreted that, and I believe um, the agency has always interpreted and applied that to mean that our regulations um, can't be based on the state of residence. So, in other words, if we issue a fishing permit to vessel A, uh, we can't say, well, your your possession limit is 10,000 pounds if you come from Massachusetts, um, but if you come from New York, your possession limit is is 100 pounds. Um, we issue a federal permit, and the federal federal permit um, does not discriminate um, what you can or can't do based on your your state of residence. Now, that's a very different issue than allocating quota. Um, of what can be landed in each state, which we've clearly done uh, in a number of FMPs on the federal side, summer flounder and bluefish um, jump immediately to mind, and we've never uh, had any national standard for issues with those state by state allocations. So allocating quota to a state for landing is a very different, in my mind, a very different question than discriminating of the residents of a state in terms of what they can or can't do um, with their federal permit. I hope that that helps a little bit. All right, thanks, Mike. We'll, we'll take that as the reply for right now. And uh, as we get into motions later, perhaps that information will be used in rationalizations for motions. Thank you. Uh, next up, I've got Dan Farnham. And Dan, you are presently muted in the webinar. There you go. You're unmuted in the webinar. Make sure your local device is not muted. Go ahead. I'm unmuted. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, thank you. Very good. Thank you. Um, number one, my internet is, is starting to I'm starting to lose it here. If I do, I'm going to call in on my cell phone. Um, but in the meantime, I just have a quick question for staff. Um, the on, on the memo for staff recommendations that I have for regional configuration alternatives, I thought the original memo had down some alternative, sub alternative 1G1, which is two regions, but now in the presentation, if I read it or heard it correctly, it's 1G2 with three, um, three regions with New Jersey being alone. If that's the case, is there any rationale? If, if I read this right and I see it right, um, what was the rationale for changing it, the opinion, if you did? Thank you. So you, you did read that correctly. That was a change in the council staff recommendation from the December meeting. Uh, Julia, would you like to go ahead and just uh, go ahead and offer Dan some feedback on that? Sure, yeah, that's correct. Um, back in December, the council staff recommendation was for two regions. Um, 
again, because it was a more simple approach, um, kind of just directly taking the regions and splitting them up that way. Um, but then after further consideration and, you know, discussion with staff um, and others, you know, it was determined that, like, New Jersey is in a unique position, and the stock assessment itself did acknowledge that New Jersey straddles that boundary. Um, and it's not overly complicated to add on another step to split New Jersey out the way that it's described in a document where New Jersey would be treated as if half of its allocation is associated with the North and half associated with the South. So just, you know, further consideration, it did seem appropriate to add one additional step in the calculation to um, acknowledge the unique position of New Jersey. Great. Thanks, Julia. Uh, next up, I've got Dave Borden. Yep. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I've got a couple of questions. Uh, simple one. It, it's highly likely that somebody's going to propose something that uh, is between uh, the values will be between uh, some of the values that have been analyzed. Do we have all of the this information in a spreadsheet so it can be analyzed on the spot to answer questions about uh, its impact on on different states? So I, I can't promise, Dave, that we're going to have every analysis for every possible uh, range of percent options that could be come up with between status quo and the changes that these documents contemplate at their greatest divergence. Uh, if staff's able to at the time provide information, we'll certainly ask them to provide as much as I, they can but I can't guarantee that for every motion that comes before us today, you're going to be able to see a concrete analysis of what that percent change means to every state and in what timeline that's going to be. Okay, <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. And then the follow-up would be the on the la landing information. I, I uh, looked earlier uh, on the NOAA site at the landing information and Basically, the, I, re, I recognize that it's preliminary subject to change and it will change, but that landing information basically indicates that most of the uh, New England states, with the exception of Rhode Island, uh, caught their quota in 2020, and the states south of, of uh, New Jersey did not, and some by very substantial amounts. So I'd just make the comment that uh, that, I think, is a significant factor we're all, all going to have to uh, take into consideration. The, the last question is um, relates to an issue that's already come up, which is ITQs. And I, I'm just wondering whether or not the council staff has gotten any guidance from NOAA uh, about this issue. We have three states in the mid that have ITQs, which is certainly their right. Um, do they have, um, has the council staff looked at, at the issue of extending those ITQ fishing rights into federal waters without going through the formal process that's required by Magnuson? Thank you. Okay, we'll turn to staff if they have any input again or uh, the regional office uh, with regards to the implications of ITQs and these allocations being written into the federal fishery management plan. That sounded like a question related to alternatives impacting federal water. So I think I'll take a stab at that, Mrs. Julia. I understood the question. It was, does the document contemplate using ITQs in federal waters basically, or extending the state waters ITQs into federal waters? And the answer is no. The, there's no changes to the federal waters permit, which, um, the federal waters permit allows you to fish anywhere in federal waters, and that would continue to be the same under any of the alternatives in the document. Um, the changes in this document that we're talking about today just relate to how many fish can be landed in any particular state. Um, so anybody who has the appropriate permits could land in whatever state. If you have a federal permit, you can catch your fish anywhere in federal waters, and, you know, some all the states have different requirements for who can get a permit. There's 
plenty of fishermen who have permits in multiple states. So you could, this anything under consideration in this document, you could continue to land in a state that's open if you have the right permit. If you have a federal permit, you could continue to fish anywhere in federal waters. There's no contemplation of extending ITQs into federal waters in this document. All right, thanks for that as a direct answer with regards to not extending the ITQs into federal waters. I appreciate that. And again, since we've already had the motions to go ahead and move that into the federal FMP, we'll leave that there. Uh, absent some motion to reconsider, which I don't think is anyone is intending to make that's been brought to my attention so far. Uh, so we went through a list of initial people uh, additional hands that have gone up during that discussion uh, include John Clark and Wes Townsend. Uh, so I'm going to go to both of those individuals. Uh, let me also just bring to Dave Borden, Dan Parnum, Mike Petney, and Emerson Hasbrook that your hands are still up. Uh, if you do have something else you need to add, I see we've got a lot of them down with that, so that's good. Uh, but if you did have something else to add, then go ahead and leave the hand up. Uh, so let me go to John Clark and then Wes Townsend. John, you're up. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I just wanted to, um, we have direct experience. Eric mentioned Delaware specifically on the question about the ITQs. Uh, we did have a Black Sea Bass federal permit that was uh, up for sale a couple of years ago. We were challenged about the fact that you also needed a Delaware permit to land in Delaware. Uh, not to belabor the point, the upshot was is that yes, we were found to be fine. We were operating under Magnus and Stevens. There was no problem at the federal side uh, as far as us uh, requiring both a federal and a state permit to land black sea bass in Delaware. And it was also fine for us to allocate our black sea bass by ITQ. Thank you. Thanks for that follow-up, John. Uh, Wes Townsend, question. Uh, no, Mr. Chairman, just to, just to answer Eric, similar to what John had to say, there is all Delaware permits are not owned by Delaware residents, and it's the same way in Maryland. All Maryland permits are not owned by Maryland residents. All right, thank you. Great. Uh, Paul Reese, did you have a question you wanted to ask? You're presently muted in the webinar. All right, we'll give a moment. Again, I've got Paul's hand up, but I see he's muted in the webinar right now. Uh, we'll give him a moment. Uh, so we're an hour into the agenda. We've gone through presentations. We've gone through quite a few questions. Uh, I'm going to ask one last time for, uh, I've got Jay McNamee's hand up. We'll come back to him. Uh, we'll try to get uh, Paul Reese here. Uh, are there any other pressing questions before I ask everybody to put their hands down? And then I think we'll get on to the business of somebody getting a motion before us. So hands up if you have any more questions that have to get answered before we move forward. Uh, let me go back to Jay McNamee, uh, and then, again, we'll try Paul if we can get unmuted off the webinar. Go ahead, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And I, I was just nervous before that somebody had uh, asked my question. I didn't want to waste everyone's time, and, but I don't think it has. So my question is, there was a little bit of uh, economic information uh, in the document um, itself. My question is, I was wondering if there had been any synthesis of that information, either by uh, the Mid-Atlantic Council or the ASMFC. And I'm not sure if, you know, seeing as how this wasn't in the federal plan up until recently, I'm not sure if NOAA had looked at, um, you know, the economics or doing any economic analysis, but I'd be curious if there's any information on the economics of these various options that um, anybody is is willing to share. 
turn to staff for trying to answer the question of is there any economic information to help inform our decision making today? Um, this is Julia. I think I might be the best one to jump in here, um, unless commission staff want to. But we did have um, some pretty simple economic analysis in the document. So it's one of the backup slides. Um, it looks like it's slide number 57. If someone could move to that slide. There's a figure in the document that shows the relationship between the average price per pound and total landings broken down by region. Yeah, that one. Um, so this is as fancy as we got. So um, landings, and sorry about that, um, the x-axis, uh, it's supposed to say 0 0.51, um, 1.52, not 112233. So sorry about that. Anyway, the, um, the open circles um, show the average price per pound associated with the landings in that year for the northern region states of Maine through New York. And in this figure, New Jersey is included with the southern region. And then so um, New Jersey through North Carolina are lumped together in those solid gray dots. So what this is showing is that when you, if, so if you just first look at those gray dots and there's a gray line associated with it, they're generally more towards the right because there's higher landing on the right. So the states of New Jersey through North Carolina as a group have a greater amount of the allocation than the other states, so they have higher landings in any given year. And then you can see that that line is kind of like angling down, and that means that in years when there's higher landings in those states, the average price per pound tends to be a little bit lower. And then for the northern region states that are over to the left with the, the, um, the open circles, I guess, um, there is a, also a downward sloping line there, but you can see the equations on the chart that lower R squared value means that it's not a significant relationship. And you can see that those open circles are kind of all over the place. They're not forming a clear downward trend like the gray circles. So um, long story short that there does seem to be more of a relationship between price and volume landed in the southern region states compared to the northern region states. But the southern region states have been able to land more historically than the northern region. Um, so we didn't get into any particular like specific alternatives um, in terms of like quantifying economic impacts in this way. Um, but in general, if you look at a figure like this, you could make a conclusion like, well, based on this price and volume relationship, maybe this would suggest that um, if you have you know, a high amount of total allowable landings and you shift some of that to the north, you know, maybe that would um, have different economic impacts in the north and the south because the south does just, does seem to have more of this negative relationship between um, price and volume landed. So at the higher landings levels, they're not seeing, you know, um, like the, the full, um, some of that increase is mitigated by this relationship between price per pound and there's not that same relationship in the north so maybe the total economic benefit to harvesters could be increased if you moved some amount of allocation from the south to the north but we didn't specify you know this is the exact percentage that would maximize economic benefits um, and we didn't um, you know try to spell it out for any individual um, alternatives um, also you could make an a socioeconomic statement along the lines of, you know, due to how the states manage things differently, maybe there's differences in terms of number of people that could participate in the fisheries if you shift things to different states. So we kind of made some general statements um, along those lines, but nothing that can conclusively say, like, this is the alternative. These are the allocation percentages that would maximize your economic benefits. So I think the answer to your question, Jay, is that there has been some economic analysis done. Uh, whether or not you feel it's complete enough uh, or accurate is a different question, but I think this is something that shows some in the economic analysis has been done so far. Uh, I appreciate that. Up, thank you. Yep, thank you, Jay. Uh, let me try Paul again. I did see him get the webinar to toggle off his muting. Let's see if he can get that again. Paul Ricci, yep, there you go. You're uh, able to speak on the webinar. Make sure your device is not muted. Go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You can hear me? Yes. 
Great. So um, my question is about the council recommendation. I'm curious, uh, can staff offer any insight about how maintaining the high harvest rates of the southern states is affecting and going forward, how it's going to affect the already diminishing biomass that's down there? Um, like, is there a table of local fishing mortality in each state compared to the FMP's target, F? So with regards to the question about diminishing biomass, I think we've got a lot of information about increasing biomass in the north. Uh, I'll defer to staff if they think that information has suggested there's been a decrease in southern biomass uh, or if just the increase is increasing at the northern end at a faster rate. Uh, and then beyond that, I'll turn to staff if they've got anything else they'd like to add. Thanks, Mr. Chair. This is Caitlin, and I can at least answer the first part of the question related to the stock biomasses in each region. Um, so you're correct in saying that the southern region hasn't necessarily diminished over time. It's kind of a, a flat-ish line with a slightly increasing slope at the end of, of the last couple of years of the time series. Um, but the northern region has increased much more drastically. Um, over time, and you know, there has also been a slight decrease in the northern region in the last year or two, according to the stock assessment. Um, and then, as for the question related to S in the different states, I don't believe we have that information. Um, Julia, feel free to jump in if you have a different answer than that. But um, when it's appropriate, I also have an answer to the previous question that was asked about the states harvesting um, their you know, quotas um, as a percentage average over time. Great. So let me just see oh. if Julia has anything else she'd like to add on this topic, and then we'll come back to you to uh, wrap up that question that Emerson had. Julia. Yes. Yeah, thank you, Ms. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I would like to add on to that. So um, it's it's true there there is a figure that we didn't put in the presentation, but it's in the document that shows biomass remaining fairly stable over time in the south, but increasing in the north. Um, in general, the stock assessment does show that, you know, overall biomass is on the, last we knew anyway, on a, it's still very, very high overall, but on a downward trend compared to a peak of a few years ago. Um, but I also wanted to make it clear that we don't have separate regional, um, like, target biomass levels or reference points. Um, we're not managing them separately, so we're not aiming for like a target fishing mortality level for each region or a target biomass level for each region. Um, and that's not the intent of this action at all. We're still managing it as one stock with um, one biomass target, you know, one overall catch limit. Um, the stock assessment does use a regional structure, but in the various levels of peer review of the assessment, it was, you know, kind of very clear that it, they're not meant to be managed as separate stocks, that they're modeled separately because it helps improve the model, but they're not separate stocks. So we're going to continue to manage them kind of as a coast-wide unit. And all these alternatives would do is just shift around where fish, fish could be landed. Um, like I said earlier, if you have a federal permit, um, you can still fish anywhere in federal waters, and then you can land them in any state that you have the permit for. And states do allow, um, you know, you to have permits in multiple states. Like was discussed, you don't have to be a resident of a state to be able to land in that state. You might have to meet some other conditions depending on the state. But this is not expected to really change um, where the fish are harvested. It's going to change where they're landed. And if you only have a state permit, maybe that'll impact where you harvest your fish if you're not already fishing in federal waters. But if you're already fishing in federal waters, to some extent, you're already going where the fish are. Um, you're choosing where to fish based on a number of factors. And then you're landing also based on a number of factors, one of which is the allocation. So I um, just want to make it really clear that we're not going to um, manage these with separate catch limits. We're not managing separate regions. We're just considering changing um, how many fish can be landed in each state. All right, thanks for that, Julia. I appreciate it very much. Uh, 
Let's go back to Caitlin at this point to try to wrap up Emerson's earlier question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so as I mentioned, uh, 2020 data is not final, so I'm going to be talking just about 2019 um, back to 2015, so kind of the most recent years. Um, in those years, in general, the states from Massachusetts to New Jersey have harvested their um, their share of the coastwide quota. Um, and then some of those states have also harvested beyond that through the use of transfers from other states. Um, as for the states of Delaware through North Carolina, um, they've generally been close to their allocation. Um, in some years, they've fallen a little bit more below and they have provided transfers to other states. Um, so that's a general sense. I don't know if you would like me to give more sp specific percentages, but um, that's kind of the average across those years. Emerson, is that generalization satisfactory right now, or do you need to see specific percentages inform you that are going to inform your actions as we go through motions today? Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, well, I mean, that's that's okay, um, but it's, it's just general, right? I mean, it was in some years they were generally below their quota. Um, I don't know what that means. You know, was it 5% below or was it more significant than that? Dave Borden mentioned before that he had some preliminary 2020 data that, that showed that um, the southern states were utilizing far less than what their quota is. So Emerson, magic is appearing right before your very eyes, kind of like wow. snowflakes into the sky. <laughs> That's great. Uh, I'll you. give uh, the staff an opportunity to go ahead and put this up here. I uh, don't intend to get into a long discussion about it, but I'll ask staff to uh, leave it up here for uh, consumption by everyone. Um, all right. So what we're going to do at this point uh, is I'm going to ask uh, if anybody's still got a hand up from the board and council, we're going to go ahead and put hands down. Uh, we will go to the public with regards to comments on motions before we vote on anything. Uh, so we'll be sure to go to the public before we take a vote on motions. Uh, what we're going to do is in a moment i'm going to go ahead and ask for hands to go up of people that intend to make a motion here uh, i'll call on the first one that i see that goes up at that point uh, that motion uh, will need to it can be made by either the council or the board uh, it will need a second from the same body uh, it will then need a uh, to be made and seconded by the other body, either the uh, board or the council. Uh, we will then go ahead and if somebody has a substitute motion, I'm going to get right to getting that substitute motion posted at the same time. So once somebody makes a motion, if there's a desire to make a substitute to the motion that's posted, we're going to get that up at the same time. At that point, I'll then get a show of hands and we'll go ahead and begin debating the motions. I expect they're going to be uh, somewhat uh, in opposition to each other. Uh, and then we'll make sure that if one of those motions, when we get to a point that we vote on it up or down, it becomes the main motion. If there's another action that needs to be taken on it, we'll go ahead and do that as well. Uh, the votes, again, as Chairman Luisi mentioned earlier, will be done board first, and then assuming it passes the board, motions will then need to go before the council. So with that, let me go ahead and get a, a see, see a show of hands of people that intend to make a motion uh, on the state allocation.
All right, so I've got three hands up in the order that I saw them. I saw Jay McNamee, John Clark, and then I saw Nicola. She put her hand down. So let me first go to Jay McNamee for an uh, opportunity here to make a motion. Uh, from Jay, it would be coming on behalf of the board. So it would need a second by a board member, uh, and then it will need like motions from the council. Uh, and then we'll go ahead and turn to John Clark afterwards. Uh, go ahead, Jay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> so um, I'll make the motion, and then uh, if I get a second, I, I've got, um, I'll come back to my reasoning. So um, the motion is uh, move to approve a modified option B, which is to increase Connecticut to 3%. In New York to 9% with the change occurring over two years. And then further that motion to approve option C, the DARA approach, with the following sub options sub option C1 B, which is the allocations will be based on 50%. Uh, on the stock distribution and 50% on the initial allocations uh, at the end of the transition phase. Sub option C2 A, which is a 5% change in weights for adjustment. Uh, sub option C3 A, uh, that there will be annual adjustments to the factor weights. A modified allocation adjustment cap, which is a modification to C4-A, which is to cap the change in regional allocations at a maximum of 5% per adjustment. And then finally, uh, I will offer a regional configuration of option G2, which has New Jersey as a separate region. All right, great. Thanks for reading that, sparing me. I appreciate it very much. Uh, let me just make a note to staff, be prepared, please, to resize this so we could fit something of similar size on the screen at the same time uh, when we get another motion. Uh, so as you uh, suggested, uh, once we go ahead and get a valid motion with seconds and like motions, I will come back to you to offer a rationalization uh, before I go back to John Clark. So a second from the board for this. Uh, John Clark's hand was still up, but I don't believe that was to make a second. If I'm wrong, John, you can let me know. I believe I saw Emerson Hasbrook's hand go up. Emerson, are you seconding this motion for the board? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I am. All right, thank you very much. Uh, next hand I saw go up uh, from a council member was Tony Delernia. Uh, Tony, are you making this motion on behalf of the council? Yes, Mr. Chairman, I so move. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, we'll need a second from the council to move forward. Do we have a second for this motion uh, from the council? We've got Maureen Davidson with her hand raised. Maureen, are you seconding this motion on behalf of the council? Uh, yes, I am. Okay, very good. Uh, so we now have a valid motion before us. Uh, I'm going to turn doc back to Dr. McNamee to offer opportunity for uh, rationalization on uh, his motion. Uh, and then I'm going to turn to John Clark next. Uh, and then we'll debate the motion's uh, pros and cons. Go ahead, Dr. McNamee. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so I'm going to start off. I know there was a lot of hesitancy with the DARA approach, at least early on. Uh, where where folks were concerned about its complexity. And so what I'll offer is it's not actually at its core that complex. It's it's just the it's addition, uh, you know, with some weighting. Um, but it's it's fairly simple and, and what made it appear complex was all of the options that got added in, but those options were added in not for the sake of complexity, but to give the board um, maximum control of, over how they wanted this approach to work and how fast they wanted it to go and how far they wanted it to go. So I guess I just wanted to offer a comment that it 
at its core, it's really not that complex. It's just uh, simply taking those distributions and the historical allocations and weighting them and kind of um, combining them together. Um, and so the proposal that I've offered here kind of locks those things that made it seem kind of complex, it locks them in and so kind of takes away some of the, the mystique uh, of the proposal. Uh, and what these this per, this particular configuration does, it, it allows the change to occur slowly over a, a fairly long period. And it continues to give high weight to the historical allocations even at the end. It, it's still half of the weight is on the, the historical allocation. Um, I believe that this is the only option that um, truly addresses, uh, Caitlin showed those two objectives of the, of the document, and this one truly addresses uh, that initial bullet. Um, and, you know, this one can account for climate-driven population shifts, but it's also important to remember that these shifts can occur in both directions. A lot of what happens with uh, climate driven effects is there's a lot of uncertainty, a lot of variability in, in what goes on, and the DARA approach can, can account for that. And so this configuration, um, it, it's a really slow transition. Um, it continues to weight the historical, um, and it also addresses at, at the top there um, the inequities that have been voiced both by the state of Connecticut and New York. So it kind of gets them uh, lined up with the rest of the states and then the rest of the process kind of goes along. Um, we do something like this right now with the Canadians. So this isn't a new approach. It's been used in other applications uh, for a long time, over, over a decade at least. Um, and so if we can do it with a, a whole separate country, I'm sure we could do it amongst amongst the states. A couple of final points, Mr. Chair, and, and I'll wrap it up. Um, one thing I'll note with some of the trigger options is that when you're putting in a hard threshold based on poundage, um, you're gonna run into an issue if the assessment rescales at some point. And we've seen that happen with a number of different commission stocks. Mm -hmm. over uh, recent years. And so I just caution folks that that hard biomass um, trigger that's in there, you're gonna run into difficulty if the assessment rescales. It, it, those 3 million, 4 million, 5 million pound thresholds might not make as much sense um, in the future. Um, and again, this uh, approach, it's truly dynamic. So if the biomass shifts back to the south, to you know, south of the Hudson Canyon, this uh, approach is going to be able to attract that, uh, to track that rather, and it will be able to adjust um, to that that um, you know uh, reverse shift in biomass. So um, I think uh, I've said enough there, Mr. Chair. So um, I will. I'll let others have a chance to speak. Well, thank you very much, Jay. Uh, so with regards to the seconder for the board and uh, the motion makers for the council, I will come back to them and give them the opportunity to speak uh, on this. Uh, let me next go to John Clark, however, to see if in fact uh, he had raised his hand when I asked for people who wanted to make a motion. Uh, John, do you have a substitute motion that you'd like to offer? Thank you, Mr. Chair. I do have a substitute motion. Uh, I sent it to the uh, staff before. It's a motion uh, developed by the administrative commissioners of the Southern uh, Region, and I will read it. Uh, Move to substitute to address black sea bass commercial state allocations by approving option D, increase Connecticut quota to 3%. Option D, trigger approach with a trigger of 4 million pounds, which is a value between sub options D1A and D1B. Sub option D2B, distribution of surplus quota based on the regional biomass for stock assessment. 
Suboption D3B, proportional distribution of regional surplus quota. Suboption D4A, static base allocations. And option G, regional configuration options. Suboption G2, establishing three regions with New Jersey as a separate region. All right, thank you very much, John. Uh, Maureen uh, and Jay McNamee, your hands are still up uh, unless you intend to make a motion uh, as part of John's motion. If you could put them down, that'd be great. Uh, again, we'll come back to you with the opportunity to speak. Uh, do we have a second for this motion on behalf of the board? We have a second on behalf of the board from Ellen Boland. Okay, let me next turn to the council. Uh, do we have a individual from the council who would like to make this motion on behalf of the council? Ellen, did you want to make it both as a second for the board and as a motion for the council? Sorry, I was. I was getting off mute. Um, I'm happy to make the motion for the council as well. Okay. So uh, we'll have that motion made by Ellen Boland. Uh, I had seen Joe Semino's hand. Uh, Joe, were you going to second this on behalf of the council? I will, Mr. Chair. All right. Very good. So in like manner to the last motion, uh, let me turn to John to offer rationalization uh, on his motion. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take a five minute break. We've been at this for an hour and a half. And during that five minute time, I'm going to ask staff to take these two motions, format them a little bit to get the light sections in a similar order so we can compare and contrast these motions on the screen very easily. Uh, we'll start by going through the individuals that had seconded and made the motion in speaking for them, and then we'll open it up to the rest of the board and council members. Uh, so, John, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, going through the motion, uh, bit by bit, the first part, of course, it does provide expansion for the Connecticut fishery, which we all recognize is a unique situation. A fixed trigger gives the necessary stability to harvesters in the southern region who have been catching their allocations. Uh, Four million pounds is between the two options in the plan, as mentioned, and it's about 66% of the 2021 total quota. And it re redistributes more of the current quota than the percentage approach allocating 75% as it would allow a third of the quota to be allocated based on distribution. Um, as it's been stressed at previous meetings and even on this call right now, while the center of the black sea bass distribution is shifted north, there's still plenty of black sea bass in the southern region. Uh, so once again, we are not having a problem in the southern region most of the southern region for catching the black sea bass <clears throat> and we also recognize the fact that due to the changes in the sector allocations and the uh, commercial quota based on the assessment there could be changes necessary in the future and i think the southern region is well aware of that and you know willing to consider those down the road but for the time being we think that this motion uh provides more of the quota to the north and also provide stability for the southern region. Thank you. All right, very good. All right, so we're going to take a five minute break. We're going to come back at 225. Uh, let's just go ahead, change this board motion by Mr. Clark uh, to be consistent with everything else that we've done. Uh, and then during the five minute break, if I could just ask staff to reformat uh, this motion here. Uh, to make it look like it's divided the same way that the previous motion was. Perfect. They've already done that. We're still going to go ahead and take the five minute break, though. Uh, now staff gets the break also. So I'm actually really happy to see this because I don't have to feel bad about myself now. Uh, so five minutes, 225. 
uh, we'll have uh, Emerson, Tony, Maureen, Ellen, and Joe up. Uh, and then we'll get a show of hands for additional people that want to speak on these motions. Thanks. See you in five minutes. All right, I've got 225, so let's continue now that we've got a couple valid motions here. So let me begin um, by going back to the seconders and the makers of the motions for the council. Um, I will first ask individuals if they want to speak on it. Um, Emerson, would you like to speak on behalf of the first motion, which is essentially in speaking so when we vote our first vote that we'll be taking will be on the substitute motion essentially if you're speaking in opposition to the substitute at this point you're basically in speaking in favor of the main motion uh so let me go to emerson would you like to speak uh yeah thank you mr chairman so i'm i'm opposed to the substitute motion um, stand by for a second. I've got several devices going here, and our caucus is still talking in the background. I guess I did. So, sorry, uh, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Okay, sorry, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I'm I'm in opposition to the substitute motion, and obviously I'm in favor of the original motion, uh, for all of the reasons that Jason um, outlined when he made the motion. Um, the substitute motion you know, keeps us stuck in the past, stuck on those base allocations that um, uh, for a variety of reasons uh, were, were, were detrimental to New York and some of the other states. Um, we need to move forward with an allocation based on biomass, not based on um, landings from uh, 20 years ago or more. The northern region has 84% of the biomass, but it only has 33% of the allocation. We, we, need, we need to go into the future with this, not stuck in the past. Um, also, um, I think all of you have seen um, the letter from uh, uh, New York Senator Schumer, who's also now the majority leader of the Senate, who's watching this very closely, uh, as he has with Fluke. So, you know, we can either take care of business ourselves here with the board and the council, um, or we, we can chance having this decided for us um, through federal legislation. I'd rather we take care of business ourselves. And I think the best option is the, uh, the original motion. So I, I, cannot, I cannot support the substitute motion. That's all I have right now, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, Ellen Bowen, uh, would you like to speak in favor of the motion to substitute? Sure. Um, thank you, Mr. Chair. I mean, I want to echo uh, Mr. Clark's comments. I think he uh, laid out a lot of the reasons that we support this. I think one of the things that I would stress is that we have a lot of uncertainties um, on the table right now for our commercial fisheries when it comes to commercial recreational reallocation tax assessments, et cetera. And so one of my objectives is going to be to try to give some certainty to the commercial fishery. Um, and I think that the DAR approach mm -hmm. just creates a lot of, will create a lot of havoc initially. And I think that the um, trigger approach is the best way forward right now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Tony Delornia, would you like to speak? Thank you, Mr. Motion. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I would like to speak to my motion. Um, I think Jason mentioned it, that, that he said that this approach has been in use uh, for quite some time. I, actually, I think it was first developed when we had to deal with the Hague line in the late 70s and early 80s. And it's uh, up in uh, New England for cockfish, and it's worked out pretty good. Uh, I, I agree with everything that Jason said. That's why I was quick to jump on uh, 
making that motion for the council because I believe that it's very consistent with uh, uh, some of you may have seen a, a position uh, paper that I've written recently regarding uh, addressing species shift, how we should be managing species shift. And I think this is consistent with uh, uh, so the sentiments in the paper that I've had to be distributed to you, as well as it's consistent with the thinking of the current administration in D.C. regarding how we're going to deal with climate change. Clearly, we're going to have to deal with climate change and species shift in the management of our stocks. As a matter of fact, in 2014, the agency, NIMS, ran a, a whole workshop about dealing with species shift, and very little has come out of it since then, but this is a good attempt at a dealing with and addressing with the species shift. It also does preserve uh, the southern states' uh, ability to fish. We're not uh, just swiping fish, but we're looking at it, and it's consistent with, uh, you know, trying to preserve the, the, the past while at the same time addressing what's occurring in the future. And, uh, well, that's really about it. We either have to stay in the past, which is the substitute motion, or we can go forward in the future. And, again, let me emphasize something that Jay said. This can go both ways. This goes back and forth. And this is a, a way of uh, addressing, uh, uh, you know, where the biomass is, and uh, which is consistent with the Madison Act. Madison Act said fishermen get to manage fish offshore of their states. Well, that's what this does. So uh, for all a whole bunch of reasons I think that are right, I made the motion, and I continue to support my original motion, and I oppose the substitute. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tony. Before I go to uh, Maureen and Joe and then uh, get a list of hands that want to speak, uh, I see John Almeida's hand up. Did you want to raise an issue with the process we're following here? Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, can you hear me okay? Just fine. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah, um, just process-wise, if I could make a suggestion, um, it might be the best approach with a motion to substitute that the bodies try to perfect the motions so that when the vote for whether to substitute or not comes up, we have the motions as the bodies would best like them to be so they can make the choice then. Does that make sense? Uh, certainly, I haven't heard any suggestions for perfection of these motions along the way. Did I did I miss a comment that suggested a perfection of one or both of these motions from the speakers so far? I I, I might have misunderstood, but I I thought I heard the path that you were proposing was to go straight to a, uh, the motion to substitute, but not necessarily entertaining motions to amend to perfect the, the the two the two options here but if, if I misunderstood and, and that option's still on the table then by all means I would suggest that would be the way to to go no thank you for that clarification and no I would certainly not be precluding anything that would be under normal operations of Robert's rules at this point uh, so it, it's not my intention to preclude any other parliamentary procedures uh, outside of these motions. Thank you, Mr. Chair. No, thank you very much. I appreciate it very much. Uh, all right. So let me go to Joe Semino. Did you want to speak on these motions, Joe? Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. And I. I want to say I appreciate all the work that's gone into this document um, by staff and others, and, and including uh, Jason Nakami for for bringing this DARA approach along. Um, I I have a lot of respect for it, and Jay mentioned a concern that there's um, a lot of strong feelings that the model is too complex. To me, I agree the model is math; it's not too complex. But there's a lot of moving parts within this. And, you know, when we talked about the socioeconomic impact of any of these um, many, many alternatives, to me, that's where the DAR approach seems to be too complex. If we're slowly shifting uh, quota away from states only to get to a point where we're slowly shifting them back in such short order that no state has a chance to really increase trip limits or or have 
extended seasons compared to what they had. I don't know what it buys us, and, and I have great concerns over it, especially considering we have commercial rec reallocation uh, looming. Uh, I support the substitute motion for the for that reason. Um, I think you know, despite this idea that we have to move on from the past, I think many states representatives would would agree that you also have to protect the the infrastructure and businesses that you know have been uh, this has been so important to all these years uh the the trigger amount in the motion that's here is going to get more quoted to the north in the short term um as i said we're going to get by a new allocation amendment that being commercial and recreational and we'll have a an updated assessment in the near future and i, I don't see this not being revisited in the near future. So I think for right now, this is the best motion. Thank you. Thank you very much. Maureen Davidson, would you like to speak? Yes, thank you. Um, I would like to speak in defense of the original uh, motion. The motion to amend is heavily based on historic landings. Now, are we now and will continue to rely on landings that occurred decades in the past, regardless of where the actual bi biomass distribution is? Uh, I understand now one of the reasons why we're doing this is to protect the investment and infrastructure of certain states. But in doing so, we're leaving other states to struggle economically and not be able to improve their infrastructure, despite the fact that fish are right there off their shores. And I understand the need to protect what you have and what your state has invested in. But through the DARA system, the changes would be gradual. It's not as though one day your state has fish and the next day your state doesn't. Okay, we're just looking for a more fair and equitable opportunity to catch the fish that are right off our shores. Now, the DARA system is responsive to where the biomass is located. So instead of us being frozen, where we're going to be constantly competing for the fish that are there, either protecting our infrastructure or trying to promote uh, our economy in other states, we would have something that as we see the biomass change through stock assessments, we would be able to adjust, all of the states would be able to adjust to what's actually happening to the stock. I am very concerned that we are going to remain locked into the landings that happened a long time ago. And sort of for some people to remain feeling secure that their fisheries are fine, Nothing is going to change. We will always have what we had. Um, and other states will not be able to have that kind of security. Um, I understand that we are all trying to protect our fisheries. We're trying to protect our investments. But how long will we do this? Um, I would like to see some change. Uh, let's move away from these historic landings. Maybe not 100%, but Let's step away from this so that all the states can have an opportunity to benefit from, shall we say, the amount of black sea bass we now have off, have off our coast. All right. Thank you very much. I didn't mean to go on for too long. Oh, thank you very much. Much appreciated. Uh, I do uh, have a hand up from the public. Again, I will go to the public uh, for any other question or comments. Uh, prior to taking a vote on the motion. Uh, John Almeida, your hand was still up. Did you have anything else to uh, add uh, or was that uh, just up from your comments before, John? Yeah, I'm sorry, it, it was up from before. Is it still up? I'm sorry. Uh, still up as of right now. Great, okay. now it's down. Thank you so much. Sorry about that, Adam. Okay, thank you. All right, so let me now go ahead and let me get a show of hands. If everybody could put their hand down for a moment, let me get a show of hands that want to speak 
in favor of the motion to substitute. Okay, I've got Michael Lisi and Tom Fody. And I had Peter Hughes. I don't have Peter Hughes anymore. It's one of them up and down things in the room that we looked at and we're not sure what it is. Uh, I try to look at this screen and I try to envision people's faces and hands going up when I see it. It makes it more real here for me. Uh, so for right now, I've just got Mike and Tom. Uh, let me see a show of hands. If you two could put your hands down for a moment of uh, individuals that want to speak in opposition to the motion to substitute. I'm jotting them down. I got a fairly substantial list here. Right, so in terms of council and board members, uh, we've got Dave Borden, Justin Davis, Dan Farnham, Mike Petney, Jim Gilmore, Nicola Meserve, and Tony Delernia. Uh, I see Dave Borden's hand went down. Dave, was that just because I had recognized you added to the list or because you did not want to speak uh, in opposition to the substitute? Because you recognize me. All right, great, thank you. Uh, is there anyone else who would like to speak, but they aren't sure that they want to commit to to the substitute in favor of an opposition, but they know they want to speak and get something with regards to board and council members? Okay, nobody on the fence here right now. All right. So I'm going to try to split this up somewhat evenly here to try to maintain some uh, uh, decorum of debate. So let me go with uh, Dave Borden and Justin Davis. Then I'll go back to Mike Luisi. Then I'll take a couple more in opposition. Uh, then I'll come back to Tom Cody. I would request that when you're making comments, uh, please make comments that are new rationale for your position. Uh, we can save some time, hopefully, by not rehashing comments that other people have made. Uh, so, Dave Borden, you're up. Yeah, th thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I, I favor the uh, underlying motion. I'm opposed to the motion to substitute. And, and I'll just, I mean, there, Jason did an excellent job of, of characterizing the, the reasons to do that. And Emerson's added. I won't repeat that. Uh, in the interest of time, but what I would like to emphasize is that part of the reason we're in this situation is we've had an underlying uh, deficiency in terms of Connecticut for going on two decades. Um, that same deficiency exists for the uh, state of New York. Uh, New York basically controls half of Long Island Sound, uh, and that's where the Connecticut fish uh, have been most abundant. So I I, I think we should, uh, and I'd be willing to make a motion to amend the motion to substitute to add uh, a, a provision which would increase uh, the New York uh, base allocation to 9%. All right, so you're offering an amendment to the substitute, which would be a third level, which under Robert's rules, we could entertain. Uh, are you offering that increase to 9% in conjunction, I, I guess, with the uh, Connecticut increase, so it would look similar to uh, what Jay's initial motion was, Dave? Uh, that is correct. You could use the exact language so it would read option b increase connecticut quota to three percent increase new york quota to nine percent well i saw right. move. Let, let, let me, so let me ask you this question dave before we take this up now 
do you think this will materially change the vote on option uh, on the motion to substitute that it's worth taking that amendment up right now or we should see whether or not the substitute becomes the main motion and then pursue that amendment if it should become the main motion uh, my answer, Mr. Chairman, is uh, yes, and I'm also prepared to make a motion to adjust the trigger. Uh, well, we, we, can, we can go three levels deep with Robert's rules. So if there's a modification to the motion to substitute that you'd like to make, uh, we can entertain those. Let me do the following. Let me go through our list of speakers, uh, see where we are at that point, and then I'll come back to you with that potential modification. Uh, Joe Semino, were you raising a point of order with the? Uh, uh, no, I don't think that's that's what it was. Or, or were you just speaking? Okay, we're okay there. Um, all right, so let me go through a couple more comments, and you're suggesting that, and can you just describe the proposed change to the trigger that you would be offering also? Dave? Uh, I'm going to do it in separate motions in the interest of time. It might be better to take it up separately. The concept would be to lower the trigger to sub-option D1A a trigger value of 3 million pounds. Okay, so at least we know that that's out there. Let me get through a few more comments and then we'll come back to uh, pursuing uh, an amendment to the motion to substitute. Uh, Justin Davis. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so it seems like Dave Gordon and I are thinking along the same lines. And so I think I'll save some of the comments I was going to make till the point at which uh, we're able to have those motions for an amendment uh, to the substitute motion uh, on the board to discuss. I'll just make a couple general points. One is that I wanted to specifically address the fact that both of these motions incorporate an increase of Connecticut's quota to 3% rather than the 5% contemplated in option B. Um, I just wanted to get on the record that Connecticut is okay with that. Uh, our ask under option B had been for 5%. We feel that certainly the state was within its rights, wasn't making an unreasonable ask to propose being increased to 5%, given that that's sort of the de facto minimum allocation along the coast right now. And as everyone around the table seems to agree, Connecticut's quota being at 1% was just way too low uh, and didn't make sense. So Connecticut would acquiesce to an initial increase to 3% for the sake of creating more room, more flexibility to achieve a follow-on action for broader reallocation along the coast. Uh, along those lines, uh, I do support the original motion and not the substitute motion uh, for one reason being that it incorporates an increase to New York as well as to Connecticut initially. New York has also experienced a substantial rise in abundance of the species in their waters, uh, particularly in the shared waters of Long Island Sound. Like Connecticut, they also uh, enjoy a relatively low current allocation within the northern region. So I think an initial increase to New York as well as Connecticut is completely appropriate. And if you think about it, if you're thinking of increasing Connecticut from 1% to 5%, that's a 4 percentage point increase. Taking that and splitting it in half and giving 2% to Connecticut and 2% to New York, I think, is a very reasonable approach. I'll also just make the general point that I prefer the DARA approach to the trigger approach because I think it's more forward looking. You know, we think about, we can think about these approaches on a gradient of to what degree are we using historical information and historical patterns of landings and not incorporating new scientific information. I, I view the DARA approach as being all the way on one side where we're really making a big move towards a more dynamic way of thinking about allocation that incorporates more information and the trigger approach being all the way on the other side where it's more conservative, particularly with a trigger of 4 million pounds, which I view as too high, uh, and sort of giving heavy weight to historical allocations. I completely understand the appeal of the trigger, appro trigger approach to those states that currently have 
high allocations and have industries built up around those allocations. I recognize that a trigger approach might be the only path forward that's palatable for those states, uh, but I, I expect we'll have some more conversation later on uh, when there's an amendment to this motion about what the appropriate level of the trigger ought to be. Thank you. All right, thank you. I was planning to go to Michael Weesey next to speak in favor of the motion to substitute. However, the chairman has indicated he's dealing with some technical difficulties. Uh, so let me go to Tom Fodi to uh, speak on behalf of the motion to substitute. Thank you, Adam. Um, when I look at species distribution, it's been used, I think, some ways wrongly. Uh, when we started making adjustments back when we first put this black sea bass in the summer flounder plans in, we started raising the size limit on on black sea bass. We started to raise the size limit of summer flounder. As we basically have known historically, as you raise the size limit and fish move to the north, the bigger they are, that keeps going further and further north. So what you wound up with a distribution of bigger fish up north, which means the poundage was larger. I don't know if the numbers of fish are any larger. Nobody's really given me, and I've asked that question a couple of times. We, but we redistribute, redistributed the number of fish that you would catch by doing this. And I look at what, what's going on. No matter what happens in here, New Jersey is going to pretty much remain the same. In order to make this plan work years ago, New Jersey gave up 20% of its commercial quota. And so it looks like we're going to be giving up a few percentage here no matter which way we take. And we had no problem with that. But most of that quota was given to the north to basically form up because they said they didn't have the proper quotas. So we used that 20%. We didn't give it to the south as far as I can remember, but I wasn't sitting on the board at that time. That was the year I was off, for, you know, back way back when. So I look at that and, and I basically says, okay. And I have no problem giving Connecticut, I would have given them the 5% because they really have gotten stuck by this. But again, when I look at New York, I don't hear them saying, well, we'll take 8% or 7% instead of going to 9%. They're just looking for an increase. And the same way they have looked at some of flounder and other species. And they use the excuse of climate change and the fish are moving north. And a lot of times it's just because they're bigger fish up north and you're landing by the size of fish and you push the south. I also remember that when we first did this, the, the southern states on summer flounder took a huge hit. When we raise the size limit of summer flounder. And the same thing happened with New York, New Jersey, and other states didn't take a hit at all. We just increased our catch because we were basically getting bigger fish. So I, I and, and history means something. I've been around a long time, and I, people don't want to hear when I basically do history lessons here, but it does mean something. And I'm not aware, I'm not prone to basically flip a switch and just arbitrarily decide that we should move it here until I'm really, really that really understand that what, what is going on besides the climate change. I agree with climate change is affecting space. I mean, look at Kobe, how it's moving further and further north. But again, we don't know what happens with some species. Like, I don't know what's happened to weed fish. I don't know what's happened with, uh, with the flounder. I think I know what happened, but nobody, you know, we don't manage for environmental conditions. And, and it's not more than the climate change that's involved in this. It's the pollution and everything else we're doing in the bays and estuaries. And I, for the, to conserve time, I'll just stop where I am right now. That's why I'm supporting the substitute. Okay, thanks, Tom. Uh, next up, I'll go to Dan Farnham. Do you have something uh, you'd like to add in opposition to the motion to substitute that we, we haven't heard so far? And Dan, if you did want to speak, you're presently muted on the webinar. All right, while we're waiting on Dan, uh, let me go to Mike Petney. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. I'm not sure if, if I was jumping the line or if you had, had me on your list already. I had you on the list. Okay, thanks. Um, so thanks, so thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, as I think everybody recalls from the last meeting, um, 
I, you know, voted in opposition to the motion that um, proposed to bring the state by state allocations into the federal FMP. Um, but given that that, you know, I did not prevail on that, and, and, and we are now looking at a joint amendment, <coughs> excuse me, that would bring uh, the state by state allocations into the federal FMP. You know, I'm paying close attention to this discussion. And I will say that, you know, at, at times there's there's discussions of, well, we need to do what, you know, what is legal. And, and I don't know that this is one of those, I guess what I mean is, I think we're not talking about <laughs> Something that's legal versus something that's not legal. I think what we're talking about is how can we get the the optimal um, outcome in in this situation given these discussions. And I think in this case, um, I have some concerns about the um, the trigger approach. You know, largely because it's it's not as adaptive as the DARA approach. I think with climate change and changes in stock distribution. Um, I, I'm hoping that the commission, the board, the council, you know, can start moving the needle um, to be responsive and and look at management strategies and approaches that can adapt more easily and evolve as conditions change on the in the ocean. And I'm concerned that the trigger approach, as currently described, really doesn't do that. It certainly, you know, is is an approach in the right, you know, it's, it's going in the right direction when black sea bass stock levels are high as they are right now. Um, but should we see a downturn in the stock, which obviously with climate change, things can be pretty unpredictable, um, we could easily find ourselves back in a situation with, you know, three and a half, four million pound quotas uh, and the stock having moved significantly during that time or contracted to the north um, as the stock declines, and yet the allocations would still be based on the, you know, original allocations that don't reflect a shift to the north. So, you know, I'm gonna vote against the motion to substitute because I really wanna see the DARA approach, you know, kind of get its day in, in, in court, if you will, um, for a full discussion. Because I think what the DARA approach presents is an opportunity for the council and the board, as I said, to move the needle forward uh, to look at a more responsive, more adaptive management approach that that can evolve as as conditions in the fishery and in the resource change. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, uh, Dan Farnham. Did uh, you get the uh, yes? You are able to unmute yourself. Go ahead. I did. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I had to switch modes here. We lost our power at the east end of Long Island. Um, I, I'm not going to, I'm going to be brief here. I want to reiterate everything that Mr. Pentney just, just said, and I'm, I'm going to elaborate a little bit on that. In, in my mind, this is, it, we're, we're, we're going to try, we're going to have to address the discard issue and, and potentially increasing discard issue that this fishery is going under right now. I mean, we're not just seeing uh, an, a, a small increase in the biomass up here. We're seeing a large push to the east and north with these fish. We have, we've had fish catch black sea bass last week on the Hague line. Now, now, as these things start moving that way and become more prolific up in that area, if we don't, if we don't allow more opportunities for the fishermen to keep what they're catching, and they're not even targeting these fish, but, but right now they, they have to discard them, and unless we give them more access to them as they move north and east, we're going to continue to have discards. And uh, this is this is an opportunity to turn discards into landings if uh, if I've ever seen one. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. Uh, Mike Luisi, uh, you're back with us, Mr. Chairman, I believe. Yeah, thanks, Adam. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yeah, just fine. Thank you. I had to I had to reconnect. I I lost uh, audio for for a few minutes. Um. Wow. So. After Mike, Mr. Pentney's comments, I'm a little, I, first of all, let me just say that I support the substitute motion. Um, I am not in favor of the, the leap, which I see it as um, regarding the first motion on the DARA approach. I, 
you know, it's, it's really easy when you're a state asking for more um, to ask for more. It's really easy to do that. But as a state that is going to be giving something up, it makes it very challenging. And there are six states, um, including New Jersey, you know, in the southern region that have discussed how we would approach this allocation review. And we're committed, all of us are committed to finding a solution that works for everybody, um, something that works for our industry, as well as providing for additional uh, resources, uh, allocation resources in New England where the stock is, is plentiful. Um, I've heard a number of times during this conversation, I've heard a number of people say that the stock has shifted into New England. Well, that's not the case, okay? Everybody needs to understand that this is an expansion of the stock and not a shift. We have lost nothing down in our in the Mid-Atlantic. We, we, we have the same resource that we had 10 years ago here now. And so, you know, our commitment to finding a solution to give more access to Southern New England um, is a real one. And, you know, there are, there are issues like Connecticut has with a, with a quota that they have, you know, we're committed to finding, you know, finding a little bit extra for them. Um, but this leap into this DARA approach, there's so much uncertainty. The uncertainty is where I personally, and where I know I, I won't speak for my other uh, states in the in the southern region, but I, I think they would all agree, the uncertainty about where we're going to be um, in the near future, not only with the stock assessment coming up, but with the sector allocation amendment that we're dealing with, uh, the, the uncertainty is too much. The state of Maryland relies entirely on its black sea bass quota. The fishermen, and there are a few of them on this call today, they will, they will support me in what I'm saying in, in that black sea bass is the glue holding our port together. Um, if we give up too much, it's gonna fall, it's gonna fall apart. And so what I'm, what I'm committed to, what we are committed to in Maryland is the substitute motion, which would give Connecticut a slight increase in their quota so that they can have a directed fishery and set an appropriate trigger. We're talking about a 4 million pound trigger. The quota is at 6 million pounds right now. So that's, you know, a third of the quota is gonna get distributed 85% to New England. I don't understand why there are so many people against the idea of moving forward in that direction. It, it, it's, it, it's, it's making me crazy a little bit. Like, you know, here we are as a, as a group of states where the, the, the stock has not changed. We have the resource available to us. We're trying to deal with a problem and we've come up with a solution. We're saying that we would send some quota north to increase you know, all the Northern states quotas by some, to some degree, and we can all get on board with that. And, you know, constantly, you know, I just, all I've been hearing is, you know, negative criticism of, of, around that. So, you know, it's the, we've built an industry. Our industry has built, the infrastructure is around black sea bass. If we lose too much, it's gonna, it's gonna fall apart. So this is a first step that I, I see it as a first step this substitute motion is a first step in getting to trying to, to, to trying to solve some of the problem, but not uh, taking away so much from the industry and the infrastructure that we have that things collapse. And I hope that there are more uh, people on this call that will support that idea. Uh, and, you know, a continued review, perhaps we, maybe we review this in five years and we see where we are. Um, I, I would have no problem with that. Um, but right now, jumping to the main motion and going to the DARA approach is just too much of a leap. There's too much uncertainty. 
and uh, I can't support that. So I, I'm going to support the main motion. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sorry for the long winded explanation. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman, uh, for getting yourself back online. Appreciate it. Uh, all, we all have to take on this new role of being tech support pros for ourselves here that we didn't see coming a year ago. Uh, we've heard a number of comments in favor and in opposition. I had three more speakers that I was going to uh, acknowledge on the opposition to the substitute. Uh, but one of the speakers so far has expressed a desire to amend the substitute motion. So at this point, I'm going to go back to Dave Borden, uh, who wants to offer a motion to, uh, I believe his intention is to offer a motion to amend the substitute. Uh, and assuming that's the case, then we'll go to those other speakers I had in the queue. Uh, so, Dave Borden, let me come back to you now. Uh, you wanted to take these one at a time, which I think would be great. So, if there is, a, do you intend to make a motion to amend the substitute? Yes, sir. You ready? Uh, please go ahead with your motion to amend the substitute. So, I, I would amend option B to read increase Connecticut's quota to 3% comma, and New York's to 9%, period. Okay, and that would uh, not incorporate the two-year change that was in uh, Dr. McNamee's original option. Your period was your period? Correct. All right, thank you. Did not want to put words in your mouth, but you were very clear with the period, so thank you. Uh, waiting for staff to complete getting that up on my screen. I don't know if they're still working on that. Is, is can we do I have repeat the, the motion, please? Go ahead, Dave. Can you repeat that once more? So it's, uh, the motion would read to move to amend the main motion. No, the the substitute motion. No, excuse me, the substitute motion to increase connected quota to uh, five, uh, 3 percent and New York's to 9 percent. So let's just change the wording of the beginning of this. Move to amend the substitute motion, option B. Correct. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your patience. Okay, uh, you're making that on behalf of the board. Uh, so again, if I could just get uh, everybody else to drop their hands. Justin, uh, you want to make the motion to uh, second on behalf of the board? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. I'm also wondering if I could offer a friendly suggestion on the wording, if that's appropriate at this point. Uh, go ahead. I'm wondering if it would be better worded as increase Connecticut's base allocation to 3% and New York's base allocation to 9% to reflect that that's what we're doing is increasing the, the base allocation and not setting Connecticut and New York's overall quota at 3 and 9%. Uh, let me turn to staff if they think that's more appropriate. All right, I was trying to find my mute button, but I do agree with that. Um, it does reflect that it's the base allocation that's changing to 3% for Connecticut and New York to 9%. And then I assume when we get back to the other motions, we can make a similar perfection on those, but let's just deal with this right now. Uh, so we're gonna change the word quota to base allocation in the motion here. Uh, Dave, you're fine with that? Correct. Okay. All right, so we've got the motion by Dave Borden now reads, move to amend the substitute motion, option B, increase Connecticut's base allocation of 3% and New York's base allocation of 9%. Motion for the board by Mr. Borden, seconded by Mr. David. 
Uh, would someone like to make this motion on behalf of the council? So, Mike Luisi, I saw your hand go up. Was that a comment as my co-chair here today, or was that actually to make that motion? No, thank you, Mr. Chairman. No, I was not. I will not be making that motion. I had a question, but let's see if it becomes a motion first before I ask my question. Thank you. All right, I've got Dan Farnham's hand up. Dan, you would like to uh, make this motion on behalf of the council? Uh, yes, I would, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Thank you very much. Do I have a second on behalf of the council? Tony Delerney, are you seconding this motion on behalf of the council? You're presently on mute on the webinar, Tony. Yes, Mr. Chairman, I will substitute this. I will uh, second this on behalf of the council, but do not pre-assume that it, in, uh, in, I endorse the, the motion, the substitute motion, but I will second the amendment to the substitute motion. Thank you very much. So we have a motion by Mr. Farnham, seconded by Mr. Delernia. All right, so now let's discuss and debate the amendment to the substitute only. Let's keep our, let's stay very focused just on that. So people that I had listed to speak previously, do you want to speak uh, uh, on this motion? I had Jim Gilmore, Nicola Maserve, and Tony Delernia. Uh, Jim, do you want to speak in, uh, do you want to speak on this motion? Yes, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, please. Okay. Are you speaking um, in so, favor or in opposition? Um, I'm speaking in opposition to it, and uh, I didn't get a chance before, so I'm going to delve back into the reasoning for the whole the whole deal here. So, first off, uh, it is an improvement, the 9%, and thanks to Dave Borden for recognizing the south side of Long Island Sound is indeed New York. Uh, so, thank you, Dave. Um, the... Um, it's an improvement in the motion, but it's still um, problematic to me because of it is the past and it's said before, so I won't reiterate a lot of that. But what we've done in my entire time with the commission, the council, and before that was our management is snapshots. We take a snapshot, we have these battles in these meetings, and then we come up with the solution, and then everybody doesn't want to touch it again for five, 10 years, and sorry, Mike, in five years, we may want to look at it. No one's going to want to look at this again in five years after the pain we're going through. So what we need is a change, an overall management change approach to a lot of what we're doing, not just black sea bass, not just summer flounder. John Hare's uh, study a few years ago and has continued to, um, I think there's only 30 species that are moving up, you know, up and down the coast from climate change. And if we keep continuing to do these little tweaks to fixing this problem, we're all going to be uh, in a, probably going to be in, a, in, in, in health problems because of like the arguments we have to go through. We need a new approach to this. And unfortunately, the initial, the substitute motion is just taking what we've done for decades and tweaking it a little bit more just to think that we're trying to fix this overall problem when indeed we're not doing that at all. The DARA approach um, is really where we need to go in the future for not only black sea bass, for a whole lot of species. It is the future. It And the way Jason McNamee has proposed it, it minimizes impact over a very long period of time. So there's issues about infrastructure change and loss of fisheries. We're all talking about little tiny changes over time that eventually focuses us in on what the populations are doing and how they're moving and we should be managing for that because that's what we all signed up for to manage the resources as they change. Additionally, that DARA approach doesn't run in conflict with Magnuson. It's using the most recent data. It's using um, the uh, equity. Uh, it's essentially providing equity for all the states. So Magnuson, it, there's no issue with that. So it really comes up with what Mike Pantone used the word it's an adaptive way to doing management, and it's really the way we should be going. And just my last point um, to what was said earlier was that we've got uh, a lot of uh, focus on this from the federal government. And beyond 
uh, some of the elected officials that wrote letters. We also have the Huffman bill. And now we've got the West Coast looking at this and looking at uh, changes in distribution because of climate change and that recognizing that the way we've managed since Magnuson was passed in 76 is just not working anymore. DARA is the future and it's where we got to go. So I am opposed to the amended motion, the substitute, and I'm back to the original motion because I firmly believe it's where we need to go. And with that, we can minimize impacts to each one of the members. And I understand going back to your state and saying I lost 1% is um you know di difficult to do they think they're being betrayed but the reality is they're probably not going to harvest that one percent because it's moving away and we really need to move forward on this thank you all right so i'm going to go to nicola and tony because i had their hands up still from before so uh speaking uh on this motion or since you had your hands up before on the other motions nicola Meserve. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, my comment was going to be on the initial substitute motion. Um, I do support the amendment to the substitute because I think it, it helps to move New York um, in the direction that they, they seek to move away from the historical allocations that are um, incomplete for their, their state. Um, but I, I don't support the substitute um, because it uses the trigger approach. And as has been said, it fails to um, address the, the change in the stock and the fishery conditions um, as soon as you get one pound below that trigger. And so it doesn't meet, you know, neither the council or commission strategic plans that call for us to have adaptive management approaches that, that respond to these changing fishery conditions. Um, it's been referenced as kind of good enough for now. It's a, it's a short term, uh, short term fix, but I'm really more interested in a longer term solution to the issue. Um, there's a, this, the semantics of a stock shift and expansion continue to come up. And I just wanted to address the fact that I, I recognize that the, the Southern states have not seen a, a decline in their sea bass availability, but we are awash in them in, in the North. And the increase in quotas that all the states have enjoyed last year is, is a consequence of that Northern expansion, growth, shift, all of it. Um, I do appreciate um, the, the more southern states coming with this motion and, and putting forward something that would out reallocate 34% of, of, the, of the quota. However, we just, it doesn't provide any stability in that sense um, as, as the quota may change. Um, so I, I go back to supporting the uh, the initial motion for DARA. Thank you. Thank you, Nicola. Tony Delernia. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I agree completely with what I just heard come from Jim Gilmore and Nicola Besser. Uh, 100%, I agree with. Um, let me just point out that this morning, uh, the commission uh, listened to uh, petitions from uh, uh, northern states to add the uh, speckled sea trout and Spanish mackerel uh, recognize those states and, and put them on the management board for those species. Uh, so it, it's consistent with the commission's uh, philosophy of managing, uh, giving the states the ability to have a, a, a say in managing the fish offshore of their coastlines. And uh, that's what the DARA approach does. I, subs I supported the amendment to the substitute motion because uh, I like the amendment, but I still will oppose the substitute motion, and I will support uh, I will support uh, uh, the original DARA approach because it's consistent with everything what we're trying to do here in recognizing uh, climate change, and 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 uh, it is not a shift; it is an expansion of the stock, and it lets those states manage. Uh, the expanded stocks offshore of their coasts. And so uh, for all those reasons, I will support the amendment and oppose the substitute. Thank you. All right, so at this point, I'm going to ask for a show of hands of board and council members that wish to speak 
solely on the amendment to the substitute. Who would like to speak in favor of the amendment to substitute? Only keep your hand up if that's what you'd like to speak to. All right, I have no hands of people to speak in favor of the motion to substitute. Hands of people who would like to speak in opposition to the amendment to substitute. Okay, I've got two hands, three hands, and I've got a Dave Borden hand. Uh, Dave, were you going to speak in favor? Of, you were going to speak in opposition of your amendment? No, sir. Uh, okay, I, would so just, I would just like to, and I don't have to do it right now. You can call on the rest of the list, but I would like to comment on Mr. Gilmore's comment. Well, we're going to go ahead and uh, I've got Mike Luisi, I've got Justin Davis, and I've got Tom Fody. Um, let me start. The first hand I saw go up was Justin. Uh, so, Justin, you can speak in opposition to the amendment to substitute, and then I'm going to ask Mike and Tom to consider whether what they need to offer is going to materially change the conversation. Justin, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think there was a miscommunication. I was planning on speaking in favor of the amendment. I'll defer to you as to whether you would like to give me the floor at this point or not. No, go ahead. I, I was somewhat surprised to see you as the seconder. So go ahead in favor of the amendment to substitute Justin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'll just real briefly reiterate some of what I said earlier in the discussion about the two motions we had up on the board that I think New York has also experienced a substantial increase in black sea bass abundance in their local waters, particularly in the shared waters of Long Island Sound. I think providing some initial increase to their base allocation as well as Connecticut's is appropriate. I heard at least one person around the table today say that they were in favor of Connecticut increasing to 5% and our base allocation to me, that means that person's in favor of a 4% in, you know, increase being given to Connecticut. What this is essentially doing is taking that 4% and splitting it between Connecticut and New York, which I think is appropriate. So I'm in favor of the motion to amend here. Thank you, Justin. Mike Luisi, in opposition of the motion to amend the substitute. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, so, you know, going into this discussion and um, considering these changes to allocation, I was comfortable with Connecticut's um, suggestion for increasing their allocation. They, they, they only have a 1% allocation and they, you know, with 1% of the coastwide quota, there's really no, there's no way to have any type of directed fishery. Um, and so with the, not the shift, but with the expansion of the stock into the sound, um, I totally understand uh, Connecticut's, you know, ask for, um, you know, additional quota so that they can, they can actually try to manage a commercial fishery. Uh, you know, under under the alternative that I would be supportive of, which is a substitute motion for the trigger approach, two thirds of the quota is going to be moved. Eighty four percent of it is going to move to New England, and I think that um, you know under that scenario, New York, Rhode Island, Massachusetts, the other states that are that are in that area are going to receive additional allocation um, to help supplement uh, their baseline quota um, and therefore I do not agree I, I do not support the handout to New York with this base allocation increasing it to nine percent I I feel like Connecticut had a point we're going to address that point but I, I I cannot agree on just the handout to New York um, from from a state perspective. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Mike. Uh, 
Tom Fodi, do you have anything to add that's going to materially change uh, people's minds on the motion to amend the substitute? I guess I, I think I do, Adam. I'm going to go ahead and speak. Um, I'm listening to, uh, and Maley was listening to National Marine Fishery Service justifying the shift to the north. Instead of really looking at the quota and realize that we've had an artificially low quota, not based on what I consider real science, but basically considered on a lot of precautionary approaches, and because the north and the south, again, were not allowed to harvest, which should have been harvesting a larger quota for the last five years on black sea bass. So now to get out of the fact that we haven't been able to enlarge to basically harvest those nips to the green, that we should shift the quota to the north. And I really find this strictly objectionable. I mean, I really have a hard time dealing with this. And you know, when we start talking about politicians, we got the same politicians, and they happen to belong to the same party as the ones in charge up in New York. So it's going to be an interesting battle if we want to go into Congress over this. And I didn't want to use that. And I, I think that's a false herring putting on us in, in, this, uh, in this environment. But again, I will state what I said before. There's not any less fish in the South than there was before. And that's why this trigger approach, basically, I, and I didn't talk about it before, would basically, yeah, I agree with Mike Louisa just said. You're giving them an allocation of more fish up north. You know, I don't know where New Jersey is going to fall. I mean, they're going to, is it a, a place where we're going to be by ourselves or we're going to be put in the south so we really get penalized and take away more than the 20% we gave years, of, years ago? So I really have to look at And when you say, well, it's only going to be a small percentage in the southern states, we're all surviving on small percentages. With the COVID-19 and everything else that we've had in the south and basically watch markets dry up the same way as New England has, our industry is suffering unbelievably, and a lot of people are going out of business, both commercially and recreationally. And anything you do that will affect the next couple of years will have a dramatic effect on maybe putting those businesses out of place, put them out of business. And so I really got to look out for what's going on for all the states south of me. Dave Borden, last word on this motion. Then I'm going to go to the public specifically on the motion to amend the substitute. We're going to caucus and then we're going to vote. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just like to follow up on Jim Gilmore's comment. I, I totally agree with all the logic that he presented. So I just want to be clear on the record um, that I like the original motion that Jason made, but since we have a substitute, it's on the table, and we're we're going to uh, vote on it first, which we may never get back to the original motion in that case, in uh, under certain circumstances. That I'm trying to make the underlying motion as palatable as possible, uh, not because I prefer it, because I I want to fine tune the ingredients in that motion so that uh, should it pass, uh, it addresses some of the concerns that various board members have raised. So that's my purpose in terms of making these amendments. I still support the underlying motion, the original motion that Jason made, uh, and will probably vote that way in the end, but I'm trying to uh, at least correct some of these deficiencies. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you very much. If I could have board and council members put their hands down, most everybody, I've got four still up that are people that have spoken recently. Uh, let me next turn to the public, specifically for or against comments on the motion to amend the substitute motion. I've got Greg DiDomenico. Go ahead. You're toggling between, uh, uh, you're back and forth. Right now, you're not muted on the webinar, Greg. Give that a try. Make sure your local device is not muted. It is not. I can hear you. I hope you can hear me. Go ahead, Greg. Uh, this is Greg DiDomenico, Lunds Fisheries, Cape May, New Jersey. 
on behalf of Lund's Fishery, we oppose this. Uh, we oppose the um, substitute motion. Thank you. Thank you very much for your being very direct. It's greatly appreciated. Uh, James Fletcher, comment uh, with regards to the motion to amend the substitute. The International Fishermen's Association opposes this motion, but we also bring to light that we have put on the table a way to enhance the stock that New York and Connecticut can get fish through enhancement and not have to take anything from the southern states. And it has not been discussed. But we oppose this motion. Okay, thank you very much, Mr. Fletcher. Uh, we're now going to take two minutes uh, to caucus. Uh, actual, what I'm going to ask states to do during their caucusing also, and maybe we'll extend this out to three minutes, uh, is to begin the conversation at the state level on the other motions as well. Uh, so let's take a couple moments to caucus. Uh, we will come back. We will uh, call the question on the motion to amend for the board. If it passes the board, Chairman Luisi will then take the motion up for the council. Three minutes, 3.33. All right, I've got 333. Is there any state delegation on the commission side that is not prepared to vote? Okay, I'm not seeing any indication of that. Hey, uh, Adam, so, Adam, do you want me to yes. take these hands down? I'm going to take these hands down if that's okay. There's three hands All that right, are up. I think they're left over. Sure. Greg DiDomenico, Dave Borden, Mike Luisi, Justin Davis. Tony's about to remove your hands. Okay. All right. There's new meaning to all thumbs now. Okay. Uh, on behalf of, so motion, move to amend the substitute motion. Option B, increase Connecticut's base allocation of 3% and New York's base allocation to 9%. All those state delegations in favor of the motion, please raise your hand. I have four in favor, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, Massachusetts. Please lower those hands. Massachusetts still has a hand raised. Okay, I didn't want to set Tony free again. All those state delegations in opposition to the motion to amend the substitute, please raise a hand. I count six. I have Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, North Carolina, Potomac River Fisheries Commission. Please go ahead and put those hands down. Abstentions on the motion to amend. I have two, New Hampshire and National Marine Fisheries Service. That's 12 votes. The motion fails the board, four in favor, six opposed, two abstentions. Uh, Chairman Luisi, did you have something to add with your hand? No, no Adam, okay. sorry. I, I thought I put I it down. Very good. Uh, because uh, motion fails, four in favor, six opposed, Two abstentions. Right, so it doesn't um, need to go. go to, it doesn't need to go to the council at this point since it failed the board, and so we're that is correct. 
that we're back to the, sub, the, the substitute and the main motion. That is correct. All right, so I'm going to come back to Dave Borden. You had suggested you might have an op. You, you had suggested you might have something to further modify option D. However, given that the uh, option B amendment did not pass, again, I'll ask you, do you think this is going to materially change the vote on the motion to substitute, or does it make sense to move forward on dispensing with this motion and potentially take further action should the substitute become the main motion? Dave, how would you like to proceed? Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it changes the result. In other words, I think 3 million pounds is a lot more consistent with the quotas that we've had over the last uh, few years. The four is setting the value too high. Um, but given the vote on the last motion, I think we all, we all know the result uh, without voting. So I'm not going to make that. Somebody, if somebody else thinks that's important, uh, please step up and make that a motion thank you okay so we've had an awful lot of debate on this so far so what i'm going to do at this point is i'm going to go back to the public for an opportunity to comment uh on the motion to substitute with the allowance for going ahead and providing comments on the main motion at this point as well at that point, I will then come back and ask for any more for and against or any other action to modify the motion to substitute before we vote on that. So let me go back to the public again uh, for public comment on the motion to substitute and the main motion. Yeah, I've got a hand up, but Captain Julie Williams, you can go ahead and speak. Please go ahead and provide your name and any affiliation uh, that you're speaking on behalf of today. Thank you very much for joining us. Um, yes, nice to meet you, and thank you for recognizing me. Um, I'm assuming you can hear me now. Um, I represent the East Hampton Town Fisheries Advisory Committee, um, and um, I am very impressed by the way everyone is speaking and is so knowledgeable about this very complicated situation we have going forward. Um, and I appreciate both sides of the issue, having been running uh, commercial and charter boats in the Florida Keys and in Montauk with my late husband, Captain Mike Brum. Um, you know, it's important that people who um, are in the industry and have the ability to catch fish, can put them in the boat and and provide them for public consumption when they're available. And um, my um, my my industry tells me there are a lot of fish in the area right now out of uh, black sea bass. So I am for the first um, uh, the original um, option B. Um, that would increase New York to 9% because the fish are here. I also believe that the DARA approach um, is a nimble approach and will allow uh, people to um, make changes um, when necessary. And I, I do like the fact that it, it'll go over two years. It's not going to be something that we're going to just jump into. However, I do appreciate, you know, the, the people in the South you know, being, um, you know, a little uh, anxiety ridden about losing any quota. Um, we've gone through that too here. So um, I, I, I do think that we need to change the way things are done. And so uh, I ultimately, I hope that um, uh, the people that can vote will, will vote for option B. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining us today and taking the time to comment. Uh, I don't see any other hands up from the public. Is there anybody who's on the phone only and doesn't have access to the webinar that wanted to comment on these motions? Okay, seeing no other comments from the public, I 
still have hands up from Mike and Sherry. Uh, did either or both of you need to speak on something before I go ahead and ask for uh, for and against of the motions here for any further debate? Uh, Mike, hands down. Sherry Patterson. Yes, thank you. I don't know what happened. There was some sort of delay. Um, we were voting yes on that last we were going to vote yes on that last um, motion and it ended up uh, being an abstain abstention all right so i'll let me turn to staff uh given the fact that that would not materially have changed the outcome of the vote uh is there a level of comfort with just modifying this to reflect five six one or at this point that we've moved forward should we leave it as such well, how would staff like to proceed? Adam, I think we can just, re uh, we can reflect the 561 in the vote with this record. It doesn't okay. change the outcome, you are correct. All right, uh, so let the record reflect that the vote then will be five to six one that New Hampshire had a vote uh, in, uh, did not abstain, had voted in favor of the previous motion. All right, so uh, let me ask, so again, we've had a lot of debate on this. Uh, I'm not still sure where we go. I think there is, uh, I'll just put out there that I believe there's the possibility that should the motion to substitute become the main motion, that there may be another motion yet to come before us. Uh, so, again, given where we're at in time for the day, uh, is there anyone else who needs to speak in favor or against the motion to substitute before we go ahead and take the vote? All right, so I'm not seeing any hands. Uh, I had requested delegations consider caucusing uh, on the last topic uh, as well. Uh, I got Mike Petney's hand up. Mike. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. So I guess this is a point of order question, which is um, we have a motion to substitute and a main motion. Um, I know this was mentioned earlier. There, I've, I've certainly been at meetings where the idea is both motions get perfected before you vote on the motion to substitute with the idea that um, if the motion to substitute passes, uh, becomes the main motion, then you bar any future amendments um, because those should have been brought forward uh, while it was a motion to substitute. So I'm not sure, I'm not clear if you were going to entertain motions after this point, or if these two motions are effectively frozen as of right now? Well, at, at this point, Mike, we've had an awful lot of discussion. Uh, I did not hear anyone else other than Dave Borden offer suggestions for modifications to the motion to substitute. Uh, he had two options. One of them we went forward and voted on. Uh, the second item he decided to withhold. I haven't had anyone else bring anything forward. Uh, I did not hear anything during discussion about uh, interest in changing anything about the main motion, uh, but uh, following on uh, John Almeida's comments earlier, uh, I will allow before we go ahead and vote on the motion to substitute, uh, is there any specific interest in making a modification to the main motion. And again, let me ask it with, do you think it's going to materially change the outcome of the motion to substitute of the vote? To go, again, to go ahead and to make a motion for something to move, change. Uh, again, let, let's hear what you've got, but I would ask that it come forward only if you think it's going to materially change the outcome of the motion to substitute.
Okay, I got one hand went up. Justin Davis, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just to clarify, are you saying that if we don't have a, a motion to amend the substitute now that were it to become the main motion, that at that point you wouldn't entertain any more motions to amend it? No, what, what I'm saying is that should the main motion, should the substitute motion become the main motion, I will entertain whatever other motions the board would like to make that are in order at that point to modify the motion that has become the main motion. What I'm saying is that if you believe there is something about the current main motion made by Dr. McNamee that you think at this point, given the discussion we've had, we need to have discussion about modifying that main motion made by Dr. McNamee that's going to materially change the outcome of the vote on the motion to substitute. I'm willing to entertain that now, but any other motions, should the substitute become the main motion, we will then entertain those. That didn't quite come out as clearly as I hoped it would, but did that uh get through it did thank you mr chairman okay all right so i'm not seeing anything else uh mike petney your hand was still up from raising that question or did you nope okay that's down justin uh if you're good you could put your hand down please great all right so uh we are back to going ahead and we are now going to vote on the motion to substitute uh does the board need additional time to caucus? I'm not seeing any hands raised, nor am I hearing anything. So therefore we're going to proceed with the vote on the motion to substitute. All those delegations in favor of the motion to substitute for the board, please go ahead and raise a hand. I'll just note for council members that were presently on a board vote. So if you're a council member, please do not raise your hand right now. And I'm, I'm not even saying that was the case. I'll just say that was a reminder in case anybody was thinking about it. Okay, I have six votes in favor of the motion to substitute. Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, North Carolina, TRFC. Please go ahead and put those hands down. Okay, those have been cleared. All delegations in opposition to the motion to substitute. Okay, I have six in opposition. I have New Hampshire, Connecticut, National Marine Fisheries Service. Oh, I'm back to five. I lost one. Let's just make sure everybody who is in opposition, please go ahead and raise your hand. All right, I'm back to six again. I've got six hands up. I'm going to read them again. New Hampshire, Connecticut, National Marine Fisheries Service, Rhode Island, New York, Massachusetts. Okay, so we've got, you can go ahead and put those hands down. That's 12 votes, uh, six in favor, six opposed. The motion fails for lack of a majority. No action is required by the council. We are now back to the main motion. I think at this point, staff can go ahead and push everything below the main motion down the screen, blow the main motion back up, and we can then entertain uh, 
a way to proceed on that. I got a hand up from Dennis Abbott. Dennis, you're uh, muted on the webinar presently if you were trying to speak. You're yeah, now thank unmuted on the webinar. Go ahead. Yeah, thank you, Adam. You've been doing a wonderful job keeping this going. I don't think anyone could have done better. Question I would have, the substitute motion failed. Can I assume that anything that was in the substitute motion cannot be amended to be put into the main motion being that it has failed previously? That would be my question. Uh, I, if the question is, can you take anything from the substitute motion and bring it into the main motion, uh, I would say I would entertain that. Uh, I think the substantive point of the two was a trigger approach versus the DARA approach. Uh, I think if there's some element of things that want to modify something, uh, I would certainly entertain it and hear it, and then I'd have to rule on it. Uh, but right now, I think my position is is that that was the substantive difference between these two motions was the DARA approach versus the trigger approach. Follow up, Adam. Yep. Please, please go ahead, and, and your comments are greatly appreciated. Yes, thank you very much. On option C, we're really talking basically DARA versus a trigger approach. I don't think that someone could come in and substitute number two, the DARA approach with the trigger approach, maybe some sub sub parts of that, but not the major part. That's my, my issue. But thank you, Adam. Uh, Chairman Luisi, where we're at at this point, would you like to add something? Yeah, thanks, Adam. Um, I'm just going to jump. I'm just going to jump ahead and say that I think we all know where we stand on all of this. Um, with the votes being six six, I don't expect that there's going to be any difference in any vote that's made over the next hour or two where the Southern region and the Northern region are gonna find compromise. Um, anything, so if, if we were to take a vote on this, on this option right now, which is the main motion, it's gonna be six, six and it's gonna fail. Um, the Southern region has we've worked really hard to try to find some compromise as a region who is giving up uh, an enormous amount of fish to try to address a problem, and I'm very disappointed. I'm just dis I'm just disappointed in the fact that we we couldn't we we couldn't see through uh, the options and find some compromising solution to uh, you know something that the the group that's giving up the most was it was okay with. And it, I'm just disappointed in that. So I'm going to, I'm, I'm not going to support this motion. Um, I would support another motion, perhaps that stayed with the trigger, with the trigger approach, um, perhaps with maybe some different, different numbers. But you know, I, I'm not going to support the uh, the DAR approach. I think it's too much of a, it's too, it's too much of a leap um, with the uncertainty that we have and. and it's not something that I'm going to be able to support. So um, I'll leave it there. Thanks, Adam. I appreciate the you calling on me. No, thanks for that insight. And uh, in full disclosure, my goal is to wrap this up in 37 minutes, not another hour or two, but we'll do the best we can. Uh, so I do think it would be reasonable given uh, we don't know for sure. I think we've got some insight. If we took a vote on this motion right now, what would occur? I, I think we got some insight to that at this point. Uh, I think it warrants some discussion about what happens at that point. Should that fail, uh, a motion, any motion fail on setting allocations 
Uh, I think at that point we have no document uh, and this process stops entirely uh, or I will defer to you, Mike. I'll defer to staff uh, for some other way forward. But uh, I'm of the opinion at this point uh, that if we can't come up with an option that is acceptable uh, to both bodies here today, that essentially it brings this these documents to a halt. Um, and again, I'm open to other thoughts on on that. So let, let me hear, Mike, if you've got something to add, staff has something to add, and then I think my next step is to say, uh, is there anyone that wants to make any other motions relative to the main motion? Uh, my thinking, again, was that the difference between the two approaches uh, in the motions was substantially the DAR approach versus the trigger approach. Uh, if there is another approach that someone felt a motion uh, to make, uh, I think we could entertain that. If anyone wanted to make any material modifications to this main motion, uh, I think we can entertain that. So Mike, staff, do you have any thoughts yeah. about if I'm incorrect that if we can't move forward with this today, we're pretty much stop in this process and everything just remains as it is without anything in the FMP at the federal level. Uh, and then once we complete that, then we'll move into if anyone wants to make any other motion. Yeah, thanks, Adam. No, I appreciate you uh, recognizing me and I'll, I'll take that. Um, I, I won't go, I won't be long winded, but yeah, I mean, so we're at the point where this based on the previous vote in the interest of the southern region unless one of the states decides to uh, support this this isn't going to pass either and that leaves us at status quo and status quo isn't isn't something that we it, it's not solving any of the problems that exist so you know the, the challenge is where's you know the southern region put up a proposal that we thought, you know, was going to get some support um, in an attempt to provide more allocation, more resources uh, to the to southern New England, but it, it failed. And now we're here. So, you know, what my biggest fear is that we end up with nothing because I've been committed all along and I've I've made the point on the record and to my colleagues from other states that we're committed to trying to find some solution. Um, this isn't the, this isn't the answer. This option is not the answer. It's too much of a reach with the uncertainties that that exist. So I'm hoping that maybe we can try to find something. Maybe there's a way. Maybe we can. Maybe somebody can come up with uh, you know an, another substitute motion. I don't know. I, I'd like to hear from states uh, about. Maybe drop dropping the uh, the trigger line down to three point seven five rather than four. I mean, it's another two hundred fifty thousand pounds being allocated to New England, you know, to the northern states. I, you know, I think. But Adam, to your question, I think I think we need we need to end this. We're not this this isn't something I, in my opinion, that should go on to another meeting. I think we need to come up with some kind of compromise today and we need to solve the issues at hand as best we can as managers today rather than punting this until you know the spring meeting or you know a meeting of the council so that's that's where i am as as your co-chair that's that's my advice and um but i'll i'll leave it up to you to decide how you know how we how we move forward thanks appreciate that adam well, Mike, I, I want you to know that I really appreciate your making sure that this wound up at this commission meeting for me to resolve that. Thank you. I, I greatly appreciate that. Yeah, if, if we postpone it again, it will make it we'll make sure that it's the commission's meeting uh, instead of the council's uh, June meeting. All right. So I, I really don't I, I don't want to go back and forth and have discussion about where we are. We've got to complete this or not. What I really want to do is if somebody has um, one of two things is going to happen. One, we're going to take a vote on this motion or two, 
somebody is going to offer a substantive change to the motion via amendment or substitute that they believe is likely to change the outcome of this process. So that's where we're at. Either we're going to vote on it or somebody's going to make a motion to change something. So I have a number of hands that are up but I'm gonna ask you to only leave your hand up if you are ready to make a motion to modify this main motion. Point of, point of order, Mr. Chairman. Yes, go ahead. I guess I'm, I'm trying to understand why those are the only two options. I mean, we, we have a motion, a main motion, we had a motion to substitute, lengthy discussion over the motion to substitute. We're back to the main motion. This could pass, it could fail. If it fails, I'm, I fail to understand why at that point, someone wouldn't be free to make a new motion. My preference would be at this point, I, I think we, we have a good sense of what will likely happen at this point? You raise a good point. No, just because we take a vote on this motion, the meeting does not come to an end. That is a valid point. Thank you for raising it. And if I per, if I provided that as a sense of things, fine. But uh, my sense is if somebody's going to make another motion, now's the time for that motion to come forward is my sense. But you, you are correct from a procedural perspective that if this fails, then some other motion may come forward afterwards. But I think my preference would be to get that out on the table now. Uh, Nicola Mazur. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You may have seen my hand go up and down a couple times there because I'm a bit conflicted. I, um, I do potentially have a motion for another option but I do not want to make it before I know for certain that um, the DARA approach cannot pass. Um, so I'll just put it out there that if, if we can take this vote, conclude whether or not DARA can pass, then I would be in a position to make a different motion for an option that I think bridges the two. Okay. Emerson, do you have your hand up to make a motion? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have my hand up to call the question. All right, thank you for that. I'll go ahead and give one last chance here. Uh, and again, in line with Mike's comments, uh, which again are completely valid, that just because this motion fails doesn't mean we can't entertain any additional motions. But the point is, is that if we don't take definitive action on the allocations today, that's when things come to a halt. So uh, do any of the state delegations need to caucus at this point? Okay, not seeing any hands nor hearing anything. We are going to go to the judges. Uh, so we are back to the main motion. Uh, all of those delegations in favor of the main motion, please go ahead and raise your hand. I have six in favor, New Hampshire, Connecticut, National Marine Fishery Service, Rhode Island, New York, Massachusetts. Let's go ahead and put those hands down. Wait, no, in Connecticut, all right, thank you. Uh, all those delegations that are opposed to the motion, please raise your hand. And we have six opposed, Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, North Carolina, TRFC. The motion uh, for the board fails, six in favor, six opposed. Okay. Are there any other motions that someone would like to put forward today? Nicola Missouri. 
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate um, working through the steps with you. Um, so I would make to, like to make a motion um, that maintains some elements of the the first motion, um, but changes the most substantive change is changing to option F, which is um, the option where a set percent of the coastwide quota is distributed based on the initial allocations. Um, this is very similar to the staff's recommended motion, but does make that change for the um, modified alternative B, where Connecticut goes to 3% and New York goes to 9%. So I'll read it into the record and I'll hope to get a second. Um, so move to adopt the following options for black sea bass commercial allocations, modified alternative B, increase Connecticut's allocation to 3% and New York's allocation to 9%. Alternative F, percentage of coastwide quota distributed based on initial allocations. Subalternative F1B, 75% of the coastwide quota allocated using the initial allocations. Subalternative F2B, remaining quota 25% allocated based on regional biomass from the stock assessment. Subalternative F3B, proportional distribution of regional quota and subalternative G2, establish three regions, one, Maine through New York, two, New Jersey, and three, Delaware through North Carolina. Thank you, Nicola. Before I ask for a second for that, just to confirm, so this is the council staff recommendation with a change to alternative B, instead of increasing only Connecticut, it is a change to both Connecticut and New York by increasing each of those states' base allocations by 2%. I'll just note that the language you have for subalternative F3B differs slightly from how staff had worded it, but you make no modification in your motion to F3B from what appears in the document? Uh, that is correct. Okay, thank you very much for clarifying that. Uh, do I have a second from the board? Uh, John Clark, are you raising your hand to second this on behalf of the board? Uh, no, Mr. Chair, I didn't realize my hand was up, sorry. Okay, Justin Davis, are you raising your hand to second this on behalf of the board? That's correct, Mr. Chairman. Okay, thank you, Justin. We now have a valid motion for the board. Uh, do we have a like motion on behalf of the council? Maureen Davidson, are you raising your hand to make this motion on behalf of the council? Yes. Thank you, Maureen. Dan Farnham, are you raising your hand to second this motion on behalf of the council? Yes, I am, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, Nicola, let me turn to you, give you an opportunity to uh, uh, further. Uh, I mean, I think you went into pretty good detail before you made the motion. Uh, now that you know it's a valid motion before us, would you like to add anything else? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, just to reiterate a couple of points that were kind of already made on the, on the prior motions, but but you know the, the problem with the DARA, I, pro, I I believe was that the 50% redistribution was too much. This is 25%, um, which is less than the trigger option that was proposed using a four million pound quota based on uh, the the current quota. So that would have reallocated uh, 30 three or 34 percent of, of the quota. So this is only 25 percent. So this is be, moderates that problem. Um, but the problem with the trigger approach from a number of our standpoints is that it, it does not do any reallocation if you go below that trigger level. So it was my attempt here to find um, an option that is in between the two um, and hopes, hopefully finds enough for, for both sides to support so that we can do something here today and not leave uh, with, with a status quo situation, which, you know, is my sense that that is, is really not a tenable situation at this point. So appreciate it. Well, we 
appreciate your patience in getting to this as well. I think we've worked through every possible combination before getting back here. So uh, let me ask for a show of hands of board and council members that would like to speak in favor of this motion. Just put your hand up if you think you need to speak in favor of it. At the, again, I think we've had substantive discussion. So if you need to speak in favor because you think what you have to say, you really need to sway somebody else's vote, I want to hear from you. Otherwise, we've had an awful lot tonight. All right, so I've got Justin and Tony to speak in favor. Uh, is there anyone that wants to be recognized to speak in opposition to the motion? Mike Luisi, did you raise your hand to speak in opposition? Yep. Okay. Uh, Chris Bat Savage, I've had your hand come up. Were you going to speak for or against or somewhere in between? Probably more along the lines of somewhere in between. Um, we'll see how it goes. All right. So I'm going to go Justin in favor, Mike against, Tony Delernia in favor, and then I'll come back to Chris. All right, Justin, you're up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. In the interest of time, I'll try to be brief here. I think this option is sort of a, a Goldilocks option. It's just right. It's kind of in the middle from the standpoint of trying to preserve some of the historic access to the resource resource that states with higher allocations have enjoyed. This option takes 75% of the quota, three quarters of it, and says we will allocate that according to the initial allocations. To me, that represents a substantial sort of retention of the historic allocation. However, it does take 25% and say we will allocate that based on science, based on regional biomass, regardless of the overall quota level. So this gets away from the issue with the trigger option where we're going to do reallocation, but only when the quota is above some level, when times are good. And then when times are tough, we're just gonna resort back to the old way of allocating and make those states that were enjoying the above tr trigger uh, reallocation essentially bear the brunt of conservation when, when we drop below the trigger. Uh, I think this, you know, incorporates options that I think there was general consensus around today at the table that there's some value in increasing Connecticut's and New York's base allocations and of establishing three regions. So for me, I think, you know, this option sort of meets that need that if these two bodies do our job, everybody should walk away from the table feeling like they got some of the things they wanted but not everything. Um, this is sort of a good compromise middle ground. And I'll just add that I, I think it would be really just a disaster if at the end of this multi-year process, all these meetings, all this work put in by staff and, and agency folks, contributions from the public, if we get to a point where we can't take action and do something here, I just think that's a real black eye for both the commission and council. So I would really urge my fellow folks around the table today to give this some serious consideration as a, a reasonable compromise. And if it maybe just takes a small change to this to get it over the line, then somebody should offer an amendment. Thank you. Thank you, Justin. Mike Luisi. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chairman. Um, and thanks, Justin, for your comments. I, I agree with a lot of what you said. Um, you know, based on my previous comments, I have a little bit of a problem with modified alternative B, um, considering New York in this in this case. But um, I may, you know, in looking at the numbers under this under the scenario that we're in with the quota that we have, um, this alternative actually provides less fish to the southern New England region than the, the trigger alternative. Um, but that's under the current situation. You know, the, the concern that I have and the and I, you know, speaking for my industry, if, if this quota were to fall um, and get below 4 million pounds, we're going to, we're going to really start to feel the, feel the, the pinch in, in our state. Um, so I don't know. I know we've talked a little bit about 
the idea of reconsider not reconsidering but reviewing kind of how the the quota uh, allocation scenario plays out over the next few years i know there's a there's an assessment this summer um i just i would feel a little more comfortable with you know under this scenario right now if it were if the increase was only to connecticut and maybe there's something added to the language for a review of the allocation alternatives if the quota drops below what you know the southern region kind of figured was was kind of the the hard line at 4 million pounds so if the quota was to drop below 4 million pounds maybe it would initiate some further you know review or action by the by the council and the board i'm i'm just i'm trying to i'm just thinking that thinking out loud which is never a good thing but you know i would feel more comfortable in moving forward with uh with those two provisions um added to this motion thanks adam adam i can't raise my hand it's tony i just but I would point out that at least, you know, through the board action process and I think through the council process as well, the board and council can um, choose to bring up an addendum at any point in time for a framework through the council process. So if the stock assessment shows something, the board and council can always do an addendum or a framework. Thank you, Tony. Now that you have everybody else's hands right, you can just jump in whenever you need to. So that's appreciated. Next up, Tony Delernio. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I uh, my hand was up, I guess, from before, so I didn't mean to put it up. But now that I have the floor, <laughs> and you know, based on what uh, Tony just said, and that's where I was going to go. Uh, can we revisit this? And you know, if it's if what I, I think is occurring is occurring and there is an expansion of the stock and uh, trying to deal with a species shift, uh, I'd like, I would be very comfortable if somehow we're obligated to revisit this in five years. I don't know if you wanted it to be, you know, want me to amend the motion, uh, but um, if we could revisit this in five years as far as what the distribution of the stock looks like five years from now, I'd be much more comfortable with this motion. Thank you. Chris Sackhaven. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, can you hear me okay? We can hear you just fine, Chris. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. I had to, had to change rooms here. Um, so I am willing to offer uh, an amendment to this motion uh, to see if we can move things forward. Um, I would. Uh, I guess start by amending in modified alternative B to remove New York's base allocation to 9% and uh, maybe to at the end add language that uh, the, uh, the allocations will be reviewed in, in no less than five or no greater than five years. And I, I can make that on behalf of the board and the council. All right, so we have Chris Scott Savage uh, that's going to move to amend modified alternative D to remove quotation marks and New York's base allocation to 9% and quotation marks and add at the end of the motion to review the state by state allocations in not more than five years. Did I hear you correctly? Uh, yes, I, I, th I think that'll that'll do. And if there's any perfection we need to that language, I'm 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 willing to uh, uh, do that. And you're making that motion on behalf of both the board and the council. Uh, yes, please. Okay, right, thank you very much. Do I have a second to the motion for the board? There were some other hands up. Joe, uh, John Clark, your hand is one I recognize. Is a new hand that popped up. Are you making this 
as a second for the board. I will second for the board. Thank you, John. Do I have a second for the council? Joe Semino, I've seen your hand pop up. I wasn't sure if that was to be a second or to uh, comment. Uh, are you seconding this motion for the council? Yes, Mr. Chair, it's to second. Right. right, so we now have a motion to amend. Uh, Chris, would you like to uh, comment on the motion to add anything beyond what you've already added? Uh, yes, real quick, Mr. Chair, because uh, I think uh, the other points have been made already. Um, you know, I, I think I think the, uh, the the motion Nicola offered is is, is probably the the best middle middle road approach to take based on uh, on the votes have gone so far. Um, the, these uh, the uh, the amendments I think are to cover some of the other concerns we heard uh, today. Um, to see if uh, if we could um, may maybe find a solution here to to reallocate uh, the state quota that in, in in some meaningful way. So thanks. Let me see a show of hands, or if you have raised your hand previously, keep it up for people that want to speak in favor of this motion. Hands to speak in favor of the motion only. Dave Borden, your hand was up prior. Did you want to speak in favor of this motion or not? I, I'd like to speak on the motion, Mr. Chairman. Uh, could the okay. staff put up a table of state allocations that would result if this motion passes? The, uh, the, under, the un, underlying motion. The main motion? Correct. I'll go ahead and give staff a chance to think about that for a moment. Uh, we had in favor uh, all those people that want to speak in opposition to the motion to amend. All right, I've got uh, Jim Gilmore, Emerson Hasbrook, and Dan Farnham. Uh, let me first briefly go to staff. Uh, staff, do you feel that you can, with some time or in short order, uh, pull up uh, something that reflects what those changes in uh, quotas would be that would incorporate the modified alternative, or is that not something you think you'd be able to pull up in short order? is Caitlin. Um, I believe that if Nicola, who put the proposal together, were to send me her Excel spreadsheet, I could do it relatively quickly. All right, we'll go, we'll go to some speakers and then we'll see where we are. Uh, so we last heard from Chris Bat Savage in favor. I'll go to Jim Gilmore in opposition to the motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so before when I put my hand up, I was actually um, sort of on the fence about this because the one thing I clearly like was the 9% uh, for New York. Uh, I'll come back to that in a second. The thing that was concerning me still is that we were going with uh, the past. However, with the five year edition, um, that got me back over the edge. But now that we've taken the 9% out, uh, one thing that maybe um, some folks aren't aware of, but um, like several species, New York is trying to get equity within the region. So if you look across the states, take Connecticut out of it, because they're obviously, I think everybody agrees, they need to have a higher percentage. But if you go through uh, New Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, and Massachusetts, um, New York's allocation has been half of those states, which I've said many times before, makes absolutely no sense if you've got a historic fishery that was harvesting those fish and that those fish exist in the water equally, then New York had some, some equal access to it. So at least the 2% increase for New York was making this at least going in the right direction. So I was supportive of it. However, if the 9% is taken out, then I cannot support this motion because I think it's just 
somewhat punitive, quite frankly. So uh, anyway, if uh, someone wants to consider changing their mind on this and putting the 9% back in, I would vote for it. Thank you. Joe Cimino. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I, <laughs> I think if I was in, in Mr. Gilmore's place, I would feel exactly the same way that, that this seems like it's punitive and, and I support this motion and, and, and that's, that's not what it is to me at all. It's that I, I, I don't like the concept of just, you know, putting quote on the table for the sake of doing it, but none of these options were going to help Connecticut out enough to get them started in a fishery. And I hope that 3% would do that. I was supportive of five. Um, for New York at a base of 7% right now, there are other states that, that are in a similar situation. Um, and with some of these shifts in quotas, they'll, you know, they'll, they'll be moving beyond that. And some states might be moving below that. So I don't think nine is necessarily a reasonable or needed um, baseline. And, you know, these these allocation discussions are tough, but, but you know, doing it as a regional approach isn't necessarily um, that accurate either, right? Because Connecticut is, is always going to be below everyone, too. So. Thanks, Joe. Emerson Hasbrook on the motion to amend. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I agree fully with what um, um, Jim Gilmore just said. Um, I could support the, under, <clears throat> the underlying motion, but I cannot support um, this amendment. And I, I think my, um, I think that my esteemed colleagues from the south of New York need a bit of a refresher here on geography. We have a body of water up here called Long Island Sound that is situated between New York and Connecticut. The increase in fish in Long Island Sound are within both New York and Connecticut's waters. To say that New York should not get an increase here as part of alternative B is like saying that in the Chesapeake, if there was an increase in abundance of fish, that perhaps Virginia should get an increase in allocation, but Maryland should not, even though they fish in the same waters. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Dan Farnham. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I haven't been here that long, but I'm not sure what New York did before I got here <laughs> to, to get the reaction I'm hearing on this on this webinar today. I don't know. New York, let's get uh, let's understand one thing. These fish are being caught. The fish are being caught. They're being discarded. What we're trying to do is turn discards into landings. I cannot support this this motion. To amend, I could support the main motion, but not not with the motion to to amend. When you take away the two percent from New York, New New York goes up from seven percent to eight point nine percent of the overall quota. It's not going to be enough to cover what we're catching and throwing back in, into the water right now. And uh, that's where I stand. Thank you. Mr. Chair, I believe staff has a table to the effect of what was asked. All right, let's go ahead and pull that table up. Thank you. So while staff is pulling that table up, uh, Tony Delernia, you st still had your hand up. Did you have something substantive to add to this? Yes, I do, Mr. Chairman. I think some of the southern states are being a bit disingenuous, particularly the state to our south. The, the, the boats know what happens when boats leave that coast. That, they're from New Jersey. They're steaming northeast. Those boats are steaming northeast to fish, and very often they are closer to New York 
the state of New York than they are to the state of New Jersey when they're coming up to the Northeast to fish. So to say that, you know, we, well, you know, New York shouldn't get 9%, uh, 9% uh, increase in allocation of 9%. It's a bit disingenuous because uh, you realize the fish are there. You're steaming up here to fish for them in the first place, but then you're saying, well, no, no, you guys shouldn't get an increase. So I think it's a, you know, anyone who really knows how this fishery is being prosecuted understands that. And, uh, they're yeah, being a bit disingenuous when you say New York should not get an increase to 9%. Thank you. Thanks to Scott for bringing this table up. So this reflects the percentages on the main motion. And just for comparison sake, if we were to apply the amendment, I believe what or the proposed amendment, I believe what that would do is slightly decrease Mass, Rhode Island, New Jersey, Delaware, Maryland, Virginia, and North Carolina by a distribution that adds up to 2% and would then increase New York by that 2%. Do I interpret that correctly, what the amendment would do? Mr. Chair, this table is showing um the amendment that was suggested. And I also have a table for Massachusetts, the main motion um, that Nicola presented. So, so this would include the New York 2% increase? No, this includes New York with 7% only. Right, so, so, so this let me is pull up. the main motion as it stands, not the amendment to the main motion. If I understand correctly, the amendment is to remove uh, New York getting 9% at the beginning. So this is this is the amended motion and this is the main motion. Let me make it larger. Okay, you're, you're correct. Thank you. You're 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 100% correct. Thank you. Okay. So what we're going to do at this point is I'm going to go to the public. I'm going to ask for comment on the motion to amend as well as the main motion. We're then going to caucus as needed and vote on the motion to amend. And the caucus, we're going to go ahead and take a five minute caucus to give people opportunity to one, get a break because we've been at this over two hours, as well as to try to consolidate the caucus between the motion to amend and the main motion. So uh, let me go ahead and get hands from the public. We're going to go ahead and entertain comments on the motion to amend and the main motion. I think at this point, if staff could bring those both up again, so the public can comment them. I would agree. I appreciate that. Uh, let me first go to Julie Evans, please. Allowing me to speak. Um, I have to um, uh, urge uh, the people that will make this a reality to listen very closely to uh, Jim Gilmore's comments. Um, Emerson Hasbrook and uh, Dan Farnham. Um, this is a very small amount. New York is asking for this increase. It seems very stingy, I have to say, on the part of other um, uh, of the southern states exactly not to allow New York a small increase of the fish that live in the waters where they fish. These fish are going to be caught anyway. You know, they're going to be caught anyway. So um, I urge the people that can vote to allow New York a, a very small 2% increase and um, let this proposal go forward. So I do not support the amendment. I do support the original um, alternative to uh, the modified alternative um, as presented, but not. I do not support the amendment on behalf of the East Hampton Town Fisheries Advisory Committee. Thank you. Thank you. Great, Dean Domenico. 
Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Can you hear me? Yes, Greg. Excellent. Uh, so this is Greg Domenico. Um, speaking on behalf of Lone's Fisheries First, I'd like to support the um, modified uh, the uh, the amendment to modify Alternative B uh, from Mr. Brett Savage and Mr. Clark and Mr. Chimino. Uh, I would also like to point out, I believe that uh, the intent of this motion is not to cap New York at nine percent. Uh, but we, I, I think they're saying that 9% is not an appropriate baseline. Um, so if, if, if I need to be corrected on that, that would be great. But I think I understand the intent of the motion and consider the uh, intent of the motion to be friendly, not stingy and very generous. And um, look forward to, you know, continuing working on this amendment as it develops. But for now, I would like to see this. Uh, I do support this. Amendment to modify alternative B. Thank you very much. Bonnie Brady. Ah, can you all hear me? Yes, Bonnie, go ahead. Great. Thank you. Bonnie Brady, Long Island Commercial Fishing Association. Um, we cannot support the amendment. We've been asking for this on a myriad of fisheries. I've been at it for 20 years. You all have heard me. At this point, especially since we share the same waters, um, specifically around Connecticut, it would be really nice listening to other states who don't want to lose any of theirs that feel the need, cue the dog to, sorry, to help to frankly throw, throw New York a bone. We have had one fishery after another lost via state by state. And it's always a haves versus have nots. 2% for New York is amazing compared to everyone else. When we know to the north and south, you both caught, we, we were on equal par 25 years ago. Please, I, we can't support the motion to amend. We support the motion as is by uh, Ms. Davidson and Mr. Farnham. Thank you. James Fletcher. I find it amazing that as an advisor, I have put it on the table number of times. I'm opposed to it, but I have put it on the table a number of times in New York and Connecticut and do enhancement of their stock and justify increasing their landing four to three to five percent. All they have to do is the stock enhancement program. And I find it amazing it's been on the table for at least the last four years in the advisors, and it never makes it point. But I'm opposed to giving the United National Fishermen Association the proposed right now to give them anything. Thank you. Is there any member of the public who is on the phone only and not on the webinar and cannot raise their hand? All right, not hearing anything. So we are at the point where um, I'm going to uh, ask if there's anyone else who feels they have something substantive to add at this point prior to taking a five minute caucus break. Uh, Dave Borden and Emerson Hasbrook, are your hands still up from before? Emerson's down. Dave, your hand. All right, that hand's down. So I've got four hands that are up of people that want to speak at this point. Uh, so we're going to do those four people, and then we're going to take a five minute break, and then we're going to call the question. Uh, I'm going to do them in the order I saw them go up. Joe Samina. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I felt I had to raise my hand because some of the most recent comments sounded as if this is a vote to keep New York from being able to achieve 9% of the coastwide quota. This is a motion that says we don't feel that 9% is a needed baseline. It's not that New York won't get that amount of quota. If, if the biomass is there, that 25% reallocation that's moving around should get them there. If it goes away, then it, it won't. That's, you know, that's that's part of what we're dealing with with these baselines. And again, you know, we all felt that Connecticut was in somewhat of a different situation, being so low that none of these options could help. Thanks, Joe. Uh, I've got Justin Davis, Mike Luisi, Ellen and Bolin, and then we're taking a break. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I just wanted to make a very quick comment that Connecticut does not support the amendment here, but it's because of the first part about removing the bit about New York's base allocation being increased to nine percent. Connecticut does support the idea of coming up with a timeline to revisit these decisions. Five years seems appropriate, so I would just want to communicate that to other states that if that if that sort of requirement is something that might help states see their way to vote on the main motion that um, even though we're going to vote no on this amendment that is something that i think we would consider thanks thanks justin mike luisi yeah thanks adam thanks mr chairman um yeah i just i, I wanted to make sure that we would have the opportunity to comment um after we caucus in case there's something that comes up uh, during that caucus uh, regarding the motion. So if, if we can maybe just have an opportunity, if need be, uh, to comment, to make comments, uh, that'd be great before we before we cast the vote. Would you uh, be comfortable with taking the vote on the motion to amend and then take any further comments, or you think those comments may affect the motion to amend? Uh, honestly, Adam, I think I think we're at a good stopping point. Um, I need to con I need to talk with uh, my representatives from Maryland. Um, at this point, I think if we take a five or ten minute break, um, and we can talk about all of it, so that we don't have to take another caucus. Like you, you've you've made that recommendation before, um, but I think we're at a good point stopping point for for that discussion to happen. All right, Ellen Bowen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think actually I was following up, I think what Mike was saying is, is there going to be a chance to, to speak to the underlying amendment um, after caucus? I know you had requested comments for both, but I just wanted to sort of figure out when, when those would best be spoken. So, El, uh, uh, are you asking for a comment period from the board and council on the main motion or on the amendment after we come back from caucus? Uh, excellent clarification. Not asking for further comment on the amendment. Just that there's going to be okay. additional conversation on the underlying motion. All right. So the plan is five minute break. We're back at 450. We are going to vote on the motion to amend. We are then going to open the floor for any final comments on the main motion. We are then going to vote on the main motion. See everybody in five minutes. Thank you. So we have before us a motion move to amend to a modify alternative B to remove and New York's base allocation to 9% and add at the end of the motion to review the state by state allocations in not more than five years. Again, we're gonna go ahead, we're gonna vote on this motion. Uh, we'll then uh, open the floor for some limited additional debate and then move on to either calling the question on the main motion or if there's any further modifications, perfections needed for it. 
Uh, let me Mr. just go down a couple of hands here. Uh, Jim Gilmore, you had your hand up. Was there an issue regarding the caucus still, Jim? Uh, it wasn't the caucus, Mr. Chair. So I had my microphone off before, but um, is it, um, we had just discussed a possible modification to the amendment that maybe will get us through this quicker. Um, so is that appropriate at this point? How would you like to modify it, Jim? Um, I would move to amend to modified alternative B uh, and add at the end of the motion to review the state by state allocations in not more than five years. Essentially remove this, the piece on the 9%. All right, so here, here's what we're gonna do. We're gonna vote on this motion. And then if we want to add back that five year part to the main motion, we'll do that. Mike Luisi, did you have something yeah, else um, um, urgent yeah. to add? Um, well, uh, I was again, ask for, can you hear me? Yep. Okay. Yeah, I was going to ask for an extra minute. I was I was still having a caucus with um, with my commissioners, um, but we can probably handle that without. An extra minute. I, I'm just going to go on mute and uh, and talk with them before we before we cast the vote. So, um, yeah, I'll leave it I'll, there. I think I'll take a long time uh, adding the votes up. Uh, and to uh, Jim Gilmore's point, what we'll do uh, if the goal of delegations and possibly council members is to ultimately have this first part of the motion to amend removed but keep in the second part vote no on this motion and then we'll come up with a way to add the review back to the main motion all right let's go ahead and have all delegations in favor of the motion to amend as posted on the screen please raise your hand Okay, I have five in favor of the motion to amend. I now have six in favor of the motion to amend. Virginia, Delaware, Maryland, New Jersey, North Carolina, TRFC. I'm guessing I probably didn't need to read those six. Uh, but those are the six in the record. Uh, those hands can go down, please. All those delegations in opposition to the motion, please raise your hand. I need to get the hands that were in favor down. Let's go ahead, Tony. Can you just clear all the hands for me, please? If everybody could just leave their hands for a moment. Tony's cleared everybody. Please have the delegations in opposition to the motion raise a hand. I have five in opposition. New Hampshire, Connecticut, Rhode Island, New York, Massachusetts. Please lower those hands. Abstentions on this motion. I have one abstention from the National Marine Fisheries Service. This vote carries six in favor, five opposed, one abstention. Mr. Chairman, Luisi, you may now go ahead and call the question for the council. Hold on. Thanks, Adam. Um, Guys, we're we're still doing a caucus. Guys, um, I'm I, I'm on I'm on uh, I'm online right now. So just if you can just be quiet for one second, um, I need to call the question to the council. Uh, so to the members of the council, um, the motion is moved to amend to modify alternative B to remove parentheses and New York's base allocation to nine percent and add the at the end of the motion to review. Uh, review the state by state allocations in not more than five years. All those members of the council that support the motion, please raise your hand. 
And Tony, I'm going to ask if yep. you, I can't see that. So if you can, uh, if you yep, can I'll give me a count. Yep. Can you need to read the names as well or just count? Um, for the record, it wouldn't hurt to read the names. Yeah, just okay. the last name. Got it. Um, it. Yep. I have Adam Nowalski, David Stormer, Kate Wilkie, Ellen Bolin, Sarah Winslow, Peter Hughes, Peter Defer, Sonny Gwynn, Chris Kuhn, Chris Pat Savage, Joe Semino, Michelle Duvall, Dewey Hemmelwright, and Scott Lennox. If I didn't call your name and your hand is up, could you just, someone added their name as I was reading and it goes in alphabetical order, so it's hard to. So I have 14, is that what you have, Julia? I think I actually can't see all the hands. Um, so sorry, I couldn't confirm that. Okay, I didn't know if you were counting as I was. Oh, I have 14, I'll put your hands down. All right, thanks, Tony. Um, let me. We'll get the we'll get the count right, but um, let's go ahead and. If I can't see it, but are the hands down at this point? Yep, hands are down. So let me ask for those members of the council that um, oppose this motion to amend, please raise your hand, and I'm going to have Tony call that out, and I'll I'll count. As she calls it out. Thanks. Just going to give everybody a quick op opportunity to get their hands up. I have Maureen Davidson, Wes Townsend, Dan Parnum, Tony Delernia, and Paul Reese. So is that five? I think it was five. Yep, I have five. So five and 17. That's too many people but it should be five and 15. I said 14. Oh I'm sorry I'm sorry I thought you said 17. okay um, okay so 14 and five is 19 with without my vote there's one person missing um, maybe we, we could ask for abstentions. We have one abstention from no fisheries okay perfect one abstention motion carries. So therefore, we've amended um, the main motion. Uh, and so I'm gonna turn it back over to Adam and allow staff to amend that motion. And then we can take a vote on the main motion or consider uh, any alternative to that motion. Very good. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Go ahead, Adam. So we'll uh, take a moment and Staff is going to uh, provide the amended motion, which is now the property of both bodies, uh, by removing N New York's base allocation to 9% from the modified alternative B and going ahead and adding a line in about review in not more than five years. So we could see that as a main motion if we could get that amendment taken care of, please. We'll give staff a moment to do that. And Caitlin, for the wording of this, is that just an alternative B? Oh no, it's a modified still because it's three percent. Never mind, I apologize. All right, and again, this motion is now the property of uh, the joint bodies after the uh, modifications that were made to it. Uh, so at this point, uh, again, let me ask for a show of hands uh, in favor of the modified motion. Uh, again, please uh, raise your hand if you think your comments are going to materially change the uh, outcome at this point. Uh, Peter Defer, were you uh, wanting to speak in favor or did you have a general question or did you want to speak in opposition? 
Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. It's a general question and I wanted to get clarification on a comment that I thought I heard staff say is that will the review in five years take the form of an amendment or a framework? I mean, I thought I understood him say that because we've had such extensive discussion that it would be a frameworkable item. Is that true? Thank you. I'll turn to I'll turn to staff for that with one answering is it a framework on the council side? Uh, we know it can be done by addendum on the board side, uh, commission side, since that's what we're doing. Uh, and then the second element of that is, uh, would this language be interpreted as begin that process within five years, not more than five years, or have the review process completed in not more than five years? I can answer that, Mrs. Julia. Um, so once this, this right now this is an amendment for the council once this amendment is complete then after that we can make changes to the allocation through a framework in the future and i would assume that this would mean that that review would start um not within not more than five years i don't think that would mean complete it i, I would assume it would mean that it would start All right so let's let's go ahead with the, the review uh the allocation to change via framework, the review would begin in not more than five years from the time this goes into effect. And and Adam, to just to make sure I'm clear of the board and council's intention here, because the way the question was just given is not, but when the commission has had a review allocation in a certain time within its management documents, it doesn't mean that you have to initiate a management document. The board can have a discussion, review information in front of them, and then decide if they're going to initiate a management document or not. It doesn't require the document, the management document to occur, but they do have to review data and then make that decision. I think that's a good clarification. Uh, I would just refer uh, request removal of the from the time this goes into effect because it wasn't actually written into the motion before. It's in the record now that we've heard it uh, here today. All right, so uh, people that go ahead and raise hands if you feel you need to speak on this motion. Right now I have Jim Gilmore and Mike Petney is there anyone else that feels they need to speak on this motion before we go ahead and vote on it? Uh, Jim Gilmore, are you going to be in favor or oppose this motion? Your hand uh, now I, will be, I will be opposed to the motion, Mr. Chairman. Um, okay, I've got, got you opposed. Uh, Mike Petney, are you going to be in favor or against? It's actually a comment on the preceding discussion about the review process. All right. Ellen, are you going to be in favor or against? Um, I think it's just more commenting on the overall situation. Okay. Uh, so we got lots of commenting on the overall situation. Uh, go ahead, Jim Gilmore. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, just quickly, too, uh, we're going to need a caucus for a couple of minutes after this, so uh, if we can put that on the list. Um, just quickly, um, and I felt uh, obliged that Mr. Luisi commented before how he was disappointed. Uh, I am disappointed right now in that um, we are trying to work towards equity in the future, and it seems we're, we're getting stuck right now. The one comment I will make is my 13-year experience with the Commission and the Council Every time we have gotten to the point where one vote decides a management approach, we're in a lot of trouble and a lot of odds are coming up. So I just wanted to make that point and uh, we'll be voting shortly. Thank you. Mike Petney. Thanks, Mr. Chairman. Just, um, I just hope we can be clear on <clears throat> the review, the state by state allocations in not more than five years does not compel either the council or the board to take an action. It seems to me that is tasking the staff 
um, to conduct a review and present information to the council and the board, which then could be used to initiate an action. But whether that action is a framework or an amendment, um, at least I think a minor shift in allocation is probably could be done through a framework adjustment based on the current reading of the of this amendment. Um, but you know, even a, a substantial change or shift in how we determine the allocations in five years could require an amendment, um, regardless of what you know what's in what's in the regulations regarding what uh, can be done via framework action. Thanks, Mike. Ellen Boland. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, I, I wasn't being purposefully obtuse when you asked to support or oppose because I think it's going to be a, a fairly last second decision for Virginia. Um, I mean, it's always a hard vote to take when it comes to allocation. And um, I've been on the record saying that we understand that things need to, um, they need to shift as the stock expands, um, because the stock is expanding. But this that would take quota from Virginia, when we still catch all of our quota and we catch all of our quota relatively close to our coast, um, it's a pretty hard vote to take. And I know that, um, that people will be walking away from the table sort of feeling like sort of nothing went right. But um, anyway, I think this is just on the record that this is a pretty hard vote to take. And, and I also want to say that I really appreciate everybody um, being willing to listen and trying to come up with, with creative solutions to this. So thanks. So, um, we've got a number of hands that went up. Uh, again, I'm going to come back to the point of we're at a point where if you think there is something you want to change about this motion to change the outcome, uh, I think it goes without saying at this point that there's been a lot of effort been made. A lot of people have worked very hard today. We've gone down a lot of different roads. Uh, yes, we want to get to a point of something that we can all live with. Um, there's no guarantees every time we come into this discussion, we're going to get there. Uh, with the hands that are up, I'm going to ask is, uh, and those additional hands at this point would include Chris Bat Savage, Tony Delernia, and Emerson Hasbro. Uh, I would ask, do you intend to modify this motion to change the outcome of the vote? I don't think that having another period of how difficult this is, we all recognize how difficult it is. Either we've got something to move this forward or we vote on the matter and we accept the consequences. Tony Delerney, you've still got your hand up, so I'll assume that means you've got something substantial to add. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My question actually is for the regional administrator who really you recently said, well, relatively minor. How would we define relatively minor to a change in a state by state that would require that could be done by framework versus the an amendment? Based on the answer to that question, I'll decide whether or not I'm going to vote or not vote for this uh, motion. Thank you. Mike, are you prepared to answer that? Um not with anything concrete <clears throat> i don't have the so i think it's a discussion that we had in the december meeting that would um authorize changes to the the commercial quota allocation system as a framework uh, i'm not sure if there are any parameters around that contemplated in in this current amendment um council staff might be better able to answer that part of it um so, but in general, I think we would have to look at the situation and determine whether we're making, um, you know, a, a small shift and small, I don't know, uh, you know, what that would mean, um, but within the overall structure uh, or completely changing the structure. So, for example, um, shifting from a trig, you know, shifting from alternative F to um, a trigger approach or implementing DARA in a more comprehensive way. Those types of, of substantial changes um, would clearly require an amendment in my view. Um, 
sticking with this approach, but making so a small a change uh, to one of the parameters might be something we could do for a framework adjustment. All right, thanks for that. I think that's the answer we're going to move forward with. Uh, Dan Farnham, last word, and then we're going to vote. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I think it might be helpful if we could take another look at the revised table from the Massachusetts option here. Uh, the revised table, but with New York not at 9%, at 7%. Is there any way we could take a look at that before we caucus and vote? We should be able to put that up. We'll take a three minute caucus. Staff, you, you can put that back up without the, uh, as this motion's written, correct? I'm going to take their silence as they're working really hard to make that happen. Uh, while they're while they're going to either get it up or they're not, we're going to take three minutes to caucus, and we'll be back. And hopefully hey, during that three minute period, we'll get that up there. Hey Adam, this is Mike. Um, do you think you can maybe add a few minutes to that caucus? Maybe maybe five or. We'll, we'll, we'll go five, Mike. Um, we'll go five. We'll see okay. everybody back here at 520. Sounds good. Thanks. Yeah, guys, I'm back. Um, trying to figure out what to, what, what's Mike, going you're on. on. You're on the webinar. those that are diligently caucusing but can still see the screen and hear me staff has completed putting up the percentages as they apply to the current motion thanks so much for your efforts all right we're back uh here's what we're going to do we're going to go ahead and vote on this motion if the motion passes we're then going to go ahead and dispense with the other matters regarding implementation dates. If it doesn't pass, then what we're going to do is we're going to take another five minute break to allow myself to consult with Mike and other staff about what they think we might still be able to accomplish today should this not pass. Uh, or just to give a final, uh, what, what our path forward here at this point. But again, the shortcoming here is not being able to be in a room to huddle somewhere. Uh, so if this passes, then we'll move on with our business. If it doesn't, then I'm going to need a couple minutes just to consult with staff and, uh, Mike as chair of the council to determine what else we think we could possibly accomplish today. So, if staff could go ahead and put the motion back up on the board, please. All right, motion's back up. Uh, for the board, all those delegations in favor, uh, if you could go ahead and clear the hands, Tony. Okay, for the board, all those delegations in favor of the motion, please raise a hand. All right, I count. I count. 10 in favor, Delaware, Maryland, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Connecticut, National Marine Fisheries Service, North Carolina, Rhode Island, PRFC, Massachusetts. Please clear the hands. I'm waiting for all the hands to go down. They're now all down. All delegations opposed. I have two opposed, Virginia and New York. 
motion carries the board by a vote of 10 to 2. Turn it over to you, Mr. Chairman, to call the council question. Adam, I don't know. Like Did we lose Mike? No, well, he's on mute on the webinar. Okay. All right. All right, Mike, you're, we're waiting for, uh, all right, you're back off mute on the webinar, Mike. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Adam. I'm sorry about that. I was having a sidebar uh, on the other line. Um, okay, so let me get back to, I don't need to read the motion back into the record. I'm just going to call the question to the council. So um, with, the, with, with the question before us, for those members of the Mid Atlantic Council that support the motion, can you please raise your hand? And I'm going to have Tony call your names out since I can't see those. Mike, I'm just letting the hands come up because they shift in order. And I just well, yeah, want to just everybody. Take your time. Take your time. Okay. Once everybody gets settled, um, if you could just read the uh, yeah. the names of the those in support, and then we'll do opposition. Yeah, I have David Stormer, Kate Wilkie, Sarah Winslow, Peter Hughes, Peter Defer, Sunny Gwen, Chris Kuhn, Chris Fat Savage, Joe Semino, Michelle Duvall, Mike Pentney, and Scott Lennox. So I have 12. Okay. Add Adam Nawalski to that list. I oh. can't raise the hand as the organizer. Thank you, Thank you very Sorry, much. Sorry, I wasn't looking at my phone. So that's 13 in favor. I'm going to put your hands down. The hands are down, Mike. Tony, I okay. can't. 14. Sorry. Uh, that there was somebody, there was a member of the public with their hand up. Gotcha. So it's okay. Thanks, though. Okay. So we have 13 in favor. Um, all of those who oppose the motion, please raise your hand. Tony will will count those out. I have Ellen Bolin, Maureen Davidson, Wes Townsend, Dan Farnham, Tony Delernia, Dewey Hemelwright, and Paul Reese. So I have seven. All right, that, that sounds right. Are there any abstentions? I don't see any hands raised with an abstention. Yeah, that sounds right. Okay, so zero abstentions. Motion carries the council. Back to you, Adam. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Well, I, I think everyone's done a tremendous job in working forward on this today. This is definitely been very hard. We're not quite done yet. Uh, now that we have approved options for the document, uh, there's two separate actions that would still need to occur. Uh, for the board only, a implementation date would have to be approved. Uh, I think we had seen earlier today in the presentation doesn't seem like today anymore, but it still is. Uh, I think we had seen a proposed January 1st, 2022 implementation date from staff. Uh, and on the council side, we would need a motion uh, to submit the allocation amendment to the service. So let me start on the board side. And again, many, many thanks to everyone involved here today around the table. Staff for, there. for participating. So we would need a motion for the board for an implementation date. Yes, or anyone right. who would like to make Mike, that we motion. Your mic is on. Nicola. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, could I do both of those things in one motion? No, unfortunately, no? Un unfortunately not. As uh, a board member, you're going to have to make the board motion only, I believe. 
Right. I, just, I meant to, okay, if they have to be like motions, then I would move to approve a January 1st, 2022 implementation date for Addendum 33. That was the, the com combined motion I wanted to make. Thank you, staff. Move to approve Addendum 33 as modified today with an implementation date of January 1st, 2022. Thank you, Nicola. Uh, is there a second, uh, Justin Davis? You're seconding this motion, is that correct? That's correct. Thank you very much. Again, this is a board only motion. Uh, given the nature of the last vote, I'm going to go ahead and ask for a show of hands on this. Uh, all delegations in favor of the motion, uh, please go ahead and raise your hand. I'm counting nine in favor, Delaware, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Connecticut, North Carolina, Rhode Island, New York, TRFC, and Massachusetts. Let's go ahead and put all those hands down. Delegations in opposition, please go ahead and raise a hand. No hands raised, abstentions. Um, Mr. Chair, this isn't an abstention. I was trying to vote yes to approve as modified. I think I got my hand up late. This is Ellen. All right, we're, let's, let's go backwards here for a moment. Let's clear the hands. Let's, we, we've come this far. Let's do this right. All delegations in favor of the motion. Eleven in favor, and that's going to be all states, and this is going to be an abstention from the service. Would that be correct? Yes. Okay. So this motion carries eleven in favor, no opposition, one abstention. And Adam, will you say that opposition is no officially? Or did you already? Sorry. Well, the abstention is no officially. That, that's correct. There, there's 11 in favor, no opposed, one abstention, and that abstention is no officials. Um, I'm not sure if that's Maya or Caitlin now. Can you just write motion carries without objection with one abstention from no officials? Thank you, because this is final action, so we just need to make that note. And we'll turn it over now to Chairman Luisi, uh, who has now gone offline. Mike, you still with us? Well, Wes Townsend, you're on the spot. All right, not a problem. Uh, I guess I don't have to read the motion either. Uh, so, no, you're, you're actually, Wes, you're going to have to ask for the motion to submit the allocation amendment to the service. Okay, so at, I guess I'm going to have to take the motion to ask the council to send the recommendation to the service. Is that correct? I think right. and move, move to submit the Black Sea Bass Commercial State Allocation Amendment with identification of the preferred alternative to the National Marine Fishery Service. Move to submit. Peter Defer. Hey, do we have a second? Joe Semino. All right, 
I don't think we need really any more discussion on this. So all those in favor, raise your hand. I'm just waiting for the hands to settle less, then I'll read them out for you. Okay. Okay. I have um, David Stormer, Ellen Bolin, Sarah Winslow, Peter Hughes, Peter Defer, Sonny Gwynn, Chris Kuhn, Chris Bat Savage, Joe Semino, Michelle Duvall, Dewey Hemmelwright, and Adam Nawalski. All right, should be 12. I have 12, yep. And I'm going to put the hands down for everybody. And the hands are clear, so you can move on. All right, all those in opposition, please raise your hands. waiting for the hands to settle here. I've lost some council members. <laughs> um, I have Tony Delernia and Paul Reese. Hey, Tony, this is Ellen again. I'm speaking up for Kate Wilkie, who's saying that she cannot raise her hand and cannot speak. Okay. But she supported the motion. Yeah, she was a yes. This is Peter Defer. Exactly what Ellen said. All right. Okay, so that means our total now should be 13 to 2, so it passes. And Would you like to confirm any abstentions on that vote? Oh, yes. Any abstentions? Thank you, Adam. Um, for... I hadn't put the hands down yet, so if you guys okay. um, don't mind, let me just put the hands down, and I'm going to ask you to raise, if Wes, you could ask them to raise their hands again. Just tell me when stand. you're ready, Tony. I'm ready now. All right. Any abstentions? I have three abstentions, Maureen Davidson, Dan Farnham, and Mike Pentney. All right, so that should meet, make our quote our totals 13, 2 to 3. Is that what you have? Yes. And with that, the motion passes this time. And Adam, I guess it's back to you now. Great, thanks very much. Mike looks like he's on about four different times now. Are you with us, Mr. Chairman? Oh, all right, struggling. All right, thanks so much for that, Wes. Appreciate it. Uh, if I haven't said thank you, I'll say thank you again. Uh, let me turn to staff. Is there any other business uh, that needs to come before us on this action today? Adam, I just, Adam, this is Tony. I just wanted to say thank you to Caitlin for all her hard work on black sea bass in particular, this document. I, I don't know if everybody realizes, if all the council members know that Caitlin has switched on to some new species and Savannah Lewis is going to be taking over full time for Black Sea Bass. So I just wanted to say thank you to Caitlin for this and um, onward to new challenges with lobster. Uh, I'll reiterate my thanks as well from earlier today. And we managed to get an extra 68 minutes out of her on Sea Bass today, Tony. Sure, she loved it. All right. I'm sure she did. All right, seeing no further business and having completed the agenda as it was provided, we are adjourned. Uh, thank you very much, everyone, and many thanks to the council for joining us today. And we look forward to uh, you hosting us next week on the Bluefish side. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Great thank job. You. Thank you. We start tomorrow at 8.30 with Lobster, and we'll be on at 8 o'clock for anyone who wants to test their webinar. You guys have fun. Yeah, you too. We will. <laughs>